on the Family and Medical Leave Act. I don't know about anybody else in the committee, but this is kind of deja vu for me. We've all been here before. And you may recall that the committee has considered this bill on numerous occasions, and I think the House has actually passed this legislation four times. And despite the fact that there was overwhelming support for the bill, President Bush has vetoed it twice. Well, since we last met on the bill, the equation has changed somewhat. So I don't think we have to worry about a veto anymore at long last, and I expect this very necessary but very minimum labor standard can be signed into law, and, and that's what you call ending the gridlock, and I say hallelujah. Well, like it or not, the facts that make up our labor force has changed dramatically in recent years, and that in turn has had substantial impact on families. We're no longer Ozzy and Harriet with dad going off to work while mom stays at home to take care of the family. People just can't afford to be. Today, the great majority of American homes of all adult members are working just to try to make ends meet. And as a result, if a child or a member of the family gets ill, someone has to take time off from his or her work to take care of them. Or if a mother gives birth to a child unless she's superwoman, she's going to require some time away from her job for recuperation and to care for the baby. Yet many businesses don't have any family or medical leave policies. They do not make provisions for the types of things that I've just mentioned. And as a result, when a woman has a baby, or when a spouse gets sick, when a parent requires special attention, a lot of employers have been able to tell their employers, sayonara, and that's just plain wrong. We've seen people lose not only their jobs, but we've seen them lose health care and other very important benefits that also go with the jobs just when they need these benefits the most. And in this day and age, when a hospital charges uh, many dollars or more for bare aspirin, the loss of health care benefits can actually devastate a family. We've heard a lot of pontif pontificating in recent years on the issue of family values. Well, this legislation helps keep families together, and if that's not family values, then I don't know what is. The bill before us today is quite modest. It's nearly identical to the version that Congress passed last session. It allows eligible employers to take up to 12 weeks in unpaid leave in a one-year period for a serious illness, uh, the birth of a child, the care of foster or adopted child, or for the care of a child, spouse, or parent with a serious health condition. And also built into this legislation are a number of very important exemptions which I think cover most reasonable concerns expressed by certain members of the business community. Perhaps the most significant exemption is that small, is that small businesses, those with fewer than 50 employees, are not covered by this legislation. The GAO estimates that the cost to business that are encompassed in less than the, is less than $5 per employee. Clearly, this legislation is needed. It's something that should have been signed into law a long time ago, and I hope and pray that this House, indeed this Congress, will act swiftly so millions of Americans can be guaranteed job security in unexpected times of difficulty. This time, I'd like to recognize the ranking minority leader, Mr. Solomon of New York. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me welcome the, uh, the respective chairman to the committee again. It's always a pleasure to see them here. They are some of the hardest working members of this, uh, of this body, along with the Republican counterparts, uh, Bill Goodling, who saw fit to stay on my floor next to my office. So, uh, uh, Bill, it's uh, good, to, good to have you back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned gridlock in your opening remarks, and um, um, I think it's important to note that uh, much uh, was given to the uh, gridlock that existed between the Republican White House and the uh, Democrat Congress uh, in both houses uh, over the past four years. But I think the American people are going to be surprised to find out that uh, gridlock is going to continue. And the real gridlock was not just uh, that between the White House and the Congress, but it is between uh, committees in this Congress. This Congress needs desperately to be reformed. Uh, we have seen that with a uh, vote that took place on the floor last week. 
uh, when this uh, Congress attempted to reauthorize select committees, and uh, they were overwhelmingly defeated. Uh, that bill, as I understand it, uh, to uh, be brought back to the floor today has been pulled because there are not votes there to pass the reauthorization of these select committees. So I would just hope that, um, that we're going to deal with, with real reform that will, uh, will break the true gridlock in this Congress. Uh, speaking of that, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned, uh, and I would just say to Mr. Ford when he comes, that uh, uh, our Republican uh, members uh, were instructed to have their minority views uh, uh, available uh, as of last night. I think they were given until maybe 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, this committee has not had the opportunity to see those uh, minority views. And uh, I understand that uh, uh, Mr. Ford has not filed his and won't until sometime later today. Now, of course, that means that we're going to be violating the three-day rule uh, if we take this bill up tomorrow. Now, as one member who voted for the Family Medical Leave uh, Act uh, last year, um, I just uh, have a lot of concerns about what is in this legislation. And I don't want to be put into a position of having to vote against the legislation, but I'm not going to do it blindly. I'm not going to vote for something I don't know uh, what, what is in there. We have 110 new members, 63, Republican, uh, 63 Democrats and 47 Republicans who have not faced this issue before, have no idea what's in the legislation. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I say all this because I had written you a letter and I had written uh, uh, our uh, esteemed uh, Speaker Tom Foley uh, that we should not be rushing legislation through this Congress just so we could say uh, someone has accomplished something in, uh, in two weeks or two months or a hundred days. Uh, this Congress needs to know what it's doing. So I would hope that uh, uh, in the future that we would abide by this three-day rule so that we can all be better informed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, the committee will now hear H.R. 1, Education and Labor, Post Office, Civil Service, House Administration, the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. The uh, committee would be very happy to hear from the, the Honorable William Ford of Michigan to be joined by the Honorable William Clay of Missouri. Without objecting, the entire statement will appear on the record. I make one correction, Mr. Chairman. The House has passed this bill five times, not five four times. Four times. And Mr. Solomon, I'd like to reassure you about the haste with which this is being handled. The first draft that I worked on in this bill was ten years ago, and uh, this is a new experience to come back and try to pass a sixth time something that has passed five times before. I can assure you also that if you voted for it last year, you can vote for it again with no fear uh, because we uh, fended off all amendments from all directions, either those who thought they wanted to make the bill, quote, tougher, or those who wanted to make the bill, quote, weaker. And it is uh, virtually identical with the last year. There, there were a couple of minor amendments that made no difference in substance that uh, made the, the language read more comfortably for some people. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've debated this, uh, this bill for virtually 10 years. Uh, we first, uh, Mrs. Schroeder and I worked on it when I was chairman of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee with Mr. Clay. Uh, you can see something about how this issue is progressed. At that time, I was the chairman of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, and Mrs. Schroeder was the chairman of its Civil Service Subcommittee, and we started out dealing only with federal employees. And then we uh, realized, as a result of, of, of women's groups bringing it to our attention, that the workforce out there had changed very dramatically and that we should be considered something more. And our friend Gus Hawkins, who preceded me as chairman of Education and Labor, started working on it there. Now I find myself as Chairman of Education and Labor and Mr. Clay as Chairman of Post Office and Civil Service and uh, I'm not apologizing when I say we've had a lot of new ideas over this 10-year period but uh, we'd like to stick with a proven product uh, and pass basically what we sent to the previous president. And as you said, 
there, there has been a change. The new president has assured us that if we pass this legislation, he will sign it at his first opportunity. And uh, I had that assurance, as a matter of fact, before the election in November, Mr. Chairman, uh, and was being actively lobbied by the new president on what I thought the prospects of getting this bill to him early if he were elected might be. We've had extensive debate. debate. We're dealing with uh, virtually identical legislation. It's, it's been approved by strong House majorities uh, five previous uh, occasions. And frankly, given the legislative history, I see no need to go through the usual amendment process and I would favor, frankly, a rule that uh, affords all members adequate time to put their position on record and then provides that we go directly to the vote on the bill. But I'm going to, as I must, defer to the expertise of this committee on how to fashion the rule. Uh, I will ask for a longer debate than we've had in the past. There are over 160 co-sponsors of the bill now. Uh, under the debate time we had the last time, I wouldn't be able to accommodate even the members of the committee who are co-sponsors with a half a minute apiece, and that obviously is not fair, particularly since, as Mr. Solomon pointed out, we have a lot of new members who want to get on record on uh, this issue. So I would like to ask that the Education and Labor Committee have an hour and a half, and the Post Office and Civil Service Committee have an hour and a half, and the House Administration Committee have 20 minutes of general debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm here to support uh, Chairman Ford's request for the rule and also for the extension of the time uh, allowed for debate. During the eight years that I've been a co-sponsor or sponsor of this Family and Medical Leave Act, there have been a number of attempts to modify this legislation uh, in order to address concerns raised by some who, who were initially in opposition. And each compromise, or modification, and substitute amendment, Mr. Chairman, of this bill has been carefully considered and we've negotiated in good faith to create a law that would be easily absorbed by the business community. Working in conjunction with Mrs. Rockefeller, we were able to fashion a bill that I think is, is fair. I think it will help the uh, American workers without hurting American businesses. And I ask that the committee members agree to the proposed rule and allow the House to move forward on the important legislation uh, for American families. Title II of the bill under the jurisdiction of the committee that I chair provides up to 12 weeks of family and medical leave per year to civil service employees. And it also guarantees restoration to the same or an equivalent job upon the employer, employee's return from leave. Uh, the employees would continue to participate in the federal employee's health benefits plan while on leave. So I think it's a fair bill, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to insert my entire statement. Without objection, the Chairman's uh, entire statement appear on the record. Um, Mr. Ford, do you have any problem with the use of the term spouse in the legislation as you've written it? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, we all thought we knew what that meant when we went to law school. It meant whatever the state said it meant. And I think that's good enough for me. I think the states have been, since the beginning of this country, defining what uh, the status of marriage is. It's a contractual uh, when the, the government recognizes it. The churches also have, and various religions have their views about what constitutes a marriage. But the, the states define a marriage for most legal purposes uh, as a contractual arrangement that you can enter into uh, subject to state restrictions on uh, age and various other uh, characteristics of the parties entering into that uh, contract. Uh, I'm satisfied not to meddle with the uh, with the authority of the states to do that, and we never have. I spent 10 years writing legislation as the chairman of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee to govern the uh, 3 million federal employees that we have in every state and jurisdiction that, that uh, the federal government does anything in. And we found it a pretty good rule to stay away from meddling with state 
uh, definitions of the th these things whenever we could. Uh, we don't have a federal definition of the word spouse. Spouse means one thing for retirement benefits, means quite something else uh, for medical uh, care in the military, and we have a variety of, of federal definitions for very specific purposes, but we have no general definition of that word. And uh, the way I have managed not to be bothered by it is to stay away from it and let the people who are better able to do it define it at the state level. So this can, the, the word spouse is defined at the state level in your legislation? Well, we don't define it. We say a spouse, and a spouse means what uh, the state says it means. Your common sense tells you it means in Massachusetts and in Michigan, or in Georgia. You know, you can be legally married in Georgia, a, a, a girl at age 12. In Michigan, uh, we don't recognize that as a marriage. Uh, so you know, it depends on where you are, uh, what the law of that state is. So you feel it's a state rights issue. Well, it, it's bluntly put, put states' rights. It's one of those things that states are better able to do because they've been doing it ever since the beginning. We don't have a national divorce law. We don't even have a national uh, child support law. We've left that whole area of domestic relations and domestic <coughs> relationships to the states and never tried to interfere with it. And I certainly don't want to start interfering with it with, with some kind of a little <clears throat> passive bill such as this. Mr. Ford, uh, Mr. Clay, do you have anything to add on that? Oh, I, I agree with the interpretation of, of the chairman, and I think it's a, it's a question that ought to be best left to the, to the states and how they define spouse. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me uh, again welcome the two distinguished members. Uh, whom we all have a great deal of respect for. And uh, uh, let me also thank you for asking for three hours and 20 minutes of debate on this, <clears throat> on this issue. I think uh, uh, that much time is required because, again, of all the new members that we have, uh, plus those of us that have concerns about what is in this particular piece of legislation. Uh, there have been over 30 amendments uh, pre-filed uh, with this committee, Democrats and Republicans, uh, freshman members, uh, older members, and they deal with a, with, a, with a lot of questions about the legislation. And I would just hope that uh, since there is no uh, great demand for legislative time on the floor uh, right now, there are no bills pending before this House other than the reauthorization of the select committees. Uh, and the motor voter bill, which we will dispose of on Thursday, as I understand it. But uh, I would just hope that we could have an a open rule which would allow uh, your Democrat members and our Republican members uh, the ability to offer those amendments on the floor. Uh, I have, uh, following up on what my good friend uh, Joe Moakley has just uh, asked you about, uh, I have uh, concerns about the, the issue of... Uh, of what the term spouse means. And you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ford said you were satisfied uh, not to meddle. But uh, I have to tell you, uh, we are talking about federal tax dollars. We're not talking about <coughs> state tax dollars. Although in New York State, uh, our people don't have any money left because of our high, highest tax state in the nation. But uh, uh, you also mentioned that spouse means uh, uh, one thing when you're talking about retirement. Well, as I understand it, uh, federal employees, when they retire, uh, they can uh, uh, name their, their wife or their husband as the recipient for their uh, retirement benefits should one of them pass away. Uh, under Social Security, I understand that it's the same thing. You're dealing with, again, federal tax dollars, and uh, you cannot leave your Social Security benefits to a... Uh, uh, to someone other than your wife or your husband. Uh, and uh, because of that... No, your uh, spouse. Huh? Your spouse. I wrote that law, too. Well, it's, uh, again... In 1986, you may remember that Mr. Stevens, Senator Stevens and I rewrote the entire federal pension law, and it was signed by President Reagan. And, mm -hmm. and we have a special 
spouse benefit, which isn't just the way you described it. You don't sign over your pension to your wife. You sign an election at the time that you retire that when you die, you want your wife to have a survivor's benefit. By doing that, you right. reduce your own benefit for the rest of your life to pay for hers. Well, that's so you exactly share what your, your benefit with her. Well, that's exactly what I'm getting at. And uh, just uh, for example, uh, I would like to have the opportunity to offer on the floor along with Congressman Walker, who cannot be here right now because he is the, uh, conducting a whip meeting for the Republican Party. But we would like to offer an amendment which simply uh, says the term spouse means a husband or wife under the law of any state. Now, that clarifies it and says that uh, um, it has to be a husband or a wife. Uh, what else would it mean? Excuse me? I mean, what else would it mean? Well, lawyers, uh, good lawyers, try not to, to uh, enumerate for fear of... Uh, leaving something out when they can avoid it, what would you enumerate as the alternative well, to the spouse? Uh, well, that, that, that's where my concern uh, lies because, you know, and uh, uh, there are those in some lifestyles today that, uh, uh, such as uh, some kind of homosexual, uh, uh, you know, arrangement. Uh, but I don't even, have any expertise but, but even that beyond that. That's all on your side of the aisle over there. Well, you may think that, but uh, <laughs> I can assure you the Democrats calling from my district feel the same way I do, overwhelmingly by about 10 to 1. But get, getting well, back the gentleman to the gentleman yield. May, may I finish first? The, yes. No, no, about uh, what we're talking about here. Let me just uh, uh, say it goes further than that because, again, I say we're talking about tax, federal tax dollars. And I'm not willing even to go so far as to say that, uh, that uh, two young men living together or two young women or two, uh, a couple that is not uh, legally married. I don't think that they ought to be entitled to these kind of benefits. We're, we're talking about a tremendous escalation in cost of this bill. So someone like myself who, who really had a lot of problems trying to vote for the bill last year and did vote for it and was prepared to vote to even override the president on it, uh, we need to have a debate on the floor and clarify these issues. I'm not uh, uh, trying to make political points. I'm trying to, to say I would like to have a bill that I can support on that floor. And there are a lot of other members both sides of the aisle that feel the same way. Will the gentleman well, yield? I would I'd just be... like to suggest, Mr. Chairman, if this debate is typical of what we hear on the floor, I thought I understood all of my life and my professional life what a spouse was, and in the last 10 minutes, I've had doubts cast in my mind, and if that's going to be the kind of illuminating debate we, we're going to have out there, I'd like to avoid that if possible. Well, if you can confuse Bill Ford, you can confuse <laughs> well, Leslie. Let, let me yield to uh, again, and me. Bill, Bill, I have great respect for you. Yes. As I do, Bill Clay, I'm going to yield to Bill Clay. Well, I just would like to, like to know where the tax uh, money is involved in this bill. What, what federal tax monies are involved? <laughs> Bill, in your committee, uh, civil servants are covered by this bill, and we have a great many federal employees. Uh, well, where's the tax money that's involved? Federal benefits. No, These aren't federal for. benefits. Well, believe me, it's going to raise the cost. That's why we have some concern about it. The it's cost, as, uh, as defined uh, by the General Accounting Office, is $5 per year per employee. Well. That's that's all well and good, depending on how much, how many you have to replace. You take somebody with 55 employees, and uh, if you have five or six people out on medical leave at one particular time, you're raising the cost not only to that uh, private sector, you're raising it to the government sector as By well. By $30. Let me ask the gentleman, because I, you know, uh, you may have a, a bona fide point. As I interpret what you're saying is that you're trying to prevent those who are gay or homosexual from being covered under the provisions of this, of this no, no, bill? Not, no, not, not just gay, no, not uh, homosexuals or lesbians. I'm talking about uh, people that are not husband and wife. Uh, and that can be a, a, a young man and young woman living together uh, out of wedlock. Uh, Would the gentleman yield to me? Now you're really going to meddling because when I practiced law in Michigan, I was uh, frequently confronted with people that had valid common law marriages in southern states who mm -hmm. moved the location of their family to Michigan and then we had to deal with the workers' comp <coughs> claim and, and prove the existence of the marriage. We frequently did that with affidavits from the jurisdiction where, whence they came because, you know, 
I'm sure you've heard of Gretna Green in, in Scotland, just across the, the border from England, where young couples would go to the, to the blacksmith, uh, hold their hands and say, I'm not, we're now husband and wife. That's been recognized as a way of marriage, uh, I guess, for hundreds of years. And it's very common in the uh, cultures of the people that came from that part of the world, uh, the kind of people like my mm -hmm. ancestors, uh, believe very strongly in those Scottish uh, uh, mm -hmm. customs and uh, try to teach the English one from time to time a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you're going to fool around here and make common law marriages with five or six kids, ten kids uh, unlawful because of some technical concern with this bill. I don't want any part of that. Yes. If I understand uh, what you just you. said, Jerry, mm -hmm. are you saying that a single person, an employed single person with a critically ill parent cannot take advantage of this bill because they don't have a spouse? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about two, uh, two young people living together uh, taking advantage of this legislation. What about a single parent with child? She'd be perfectly covered. That's why I want to have the, the, the debate. Uh, that she would be covered under it this. It sounds to me, it's what you're saying, no. is that only people who are no. covered by this, in your opinion, would be two people called husband and wife. Absolutely not. Only when it comes to the definition of spouse in the legislation, I'm trying to clarify that portion of the legislation. It has nothing to do with a single parent with a child or Then, then what you're uh, saying is a, an ill spouse. Is that, is that what you're saying? I'm questioning two the people term get together spouse. and one of them gets very ill, yeah. that what you want is not to have leave for the person to take care of the ill person with whom they live. No. Is that it? If they have no legal responsibility for that person, then they should not be entitled to that benefit. That's no. all. We're, we're talking about the term spouse only. I think when May you go I to legal, the gentleman spouse to legal responsibility, yes. I think there's a wide gap there. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Barnett. Seek recognition. All right. All right. Excuse me? David seeks recognition. I can't hear. Mr. Boynia. I seek recognition. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I want to commend uh, the two gentlemen for the long and hard work they've spent on this, this issue for, for, for over the many years that we have struggled with it. Uh, the basic point here is that parents should not be asked to choose between their jobs and, and caring for a sick child. And I think we've got to remember that throughout this debate. There will be attempts, uh, serious attempts by the other side to make us get off of that point, and we've got to stay with basically what we were out to do originally. That's the fundamental principle behind the action that we face here today. The family should not be torn apart when illness strikes. Uh, that's when we should be giving them support. And for seven years, these two gentlemen, some of my colleagues on the other side, Marge Rockman and others, have tried in vain to try to get this thing done. And the great majority of the American people support this legislation. We passed it time and time again, and we found that the White House was the place where this was a block. Two presidents who opposed family leave got out their pen and vetoed this bill. Well, that's one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, Mr. <coughs> Chairman and my colleagues, I think we have a new president today. Americans rejected that kind of indifference. The gridlock, I hope, is over. We will find out on this bill this week. And what could we better symbolize the end of gridlock than passing this piece of legislation? It's a bill that leaves everybody in this country better off. Employers will be better off. The studies show family leave improves morale. It improves competitiveness. It's cheaper than hiring workers. It has an economic benefit. That's why the Japanese have it. That's why the Germans have it. In fact, the United States is the only, the only industrial country without it. Taxpayers will be better off. Why? Because they don't have to pay unemployment or welfare for workers who have been fired. But let's put the emphasis where it belongs this morning on the benefits that makes this bill not just good policy and sound politics, but a compelling moral issue. After all, do we really want an American where workers can be fired because they need to take their cancer-ridden child for chemotherapy? And that is what is going on in this country today. Is that the kind of America we want? I don't think so. An America that gives lip service to family values but turns its back at the very moment that people are most vulnerable in our society. For seven years, this bill has been blocked. 
And now the roadblocks are going to be removed. The road is clear. The question is whether we will go that final five yards and get it done this week. Let's get this to the president's desk. Let's put it on his desk to the man who said he is not only believes in family values, but believes in the value of families. And let's bring an end to the time when workers in this country have to choose between their paycheck that keeps them alive and the family that makes living for them worthwhile. So I would hope that we avoid these sidetracks on spousal issues. Mr. Ford and Mr. Clay have explained it very well. States define that. Let's stay with the basic concept of helping people get on with their lives, having their child delivered, having someone take after, care of that child, whether he or she be sick, or taking care of that parent who may be dying and who needs the companionship and love of their family in their last days. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, appreciate the good work that both bills have done on this measure. Bill Ford and Bill Clay and the Republican counterparts. I've consistently voted against this measure. Why? However good it is, I don't think the federal government should mandate policies of private enterprise. And I think that the family leave should be granted under a policy of each individual industry or business. Uh, the idea is great. And we all know that compassion should rule. But at the same time, if we start as a federal government mandating every right that a person has, then it is wrong. I don't think anyone will disagree with me. In that concept, I realize that uh, this measure has been up for 10 years or longer, has a lot of support nationwide, and this is just one instance where a vetoed bill, and that veto being sustained, will be up here again and again and again. Everything that Reagan and Bush vetoed, in my opinion, will be presented to the House to be enacted into law. That isn't good, that isn't good judgment, in my opinion. I think that we should treat each measure as an individual thought not because it was vetoed and sustained, but because it's either good or bad legislation. And however good this legislation is, and I admit that it is, I disagree with a federal mandate being imposed on business and industry and those who would comply. It's very, very, very good indeed that uh, Small business with 50 or less employees are exempted. And I know what we're faced with today. And I don't see any reason that we should debate the bill in the Rules Committee. We've debated it for 10 years. We know what it contains. I think that uh, any lengthy debate only gives a person like myself, and I'm using that uh, uh, privilege to make statements. So why don't we get on with our business and take it to the floor, vote it up or down, and hopefully down. But be that as it may, let's go forward. Will the gentleman yield? Be happy to yield. Um, it, it should not come as any great surprise to the gentleman from Tennessee that legislation that was vetoed by a pri previous administration would then be resubmitted once we've had an election. That's what elections are all about in this country. And I'm not, I don't know that every single bill that was vetoed by Reagan or by Bush will be resubmitted. But certainly major pieces of legislation that passed by large margins, but where we failed to override a veto by a relatively small amount, will be resubmitted. We do have a different administration now. Uh, we had an election. Uh, the election went 
the way of the Democratic Party and a Democratic president will submit legislation like this that has been supported overwhelmingly by Congress, but just short of a two-thirds vote? Well, of course, uh, the gentleman has uh, stated his opinion. We do have some 110 new members, and I think that the politics and partisan politics is, is rearing its ugly head again, as we've had for the last 30 years on the, in the House. And sometimes we should do what is right for America rather than partisan politics. I would only respond that an overwhelming majority, though short of two-thirds of this, of this House, felt that this particular piece of legislation was right for America, and uh, we did have a, a national election uh, that produced a different result, so this bill is back, and I hope it will become law. It is a piece of legislation that is, is needed uh, and has been supported by a large majority of my colleagues. Well, that's your opinion. I still stick to mine that it is partisan. We have a right to vote it up or down, and I shall vote against it. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to solve that problem by battering each other as to uh, what one administration might do and the other administration has done. I merely made that statement because I feel in my heart that's what we're going to be faced with. Mr. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Now, I would only make one other point. The gentleman uh, testifying before, we're talking about the role of state law in this, uh, in this matter. Um, uh, state law, of course, traditionally has played a very important role in terms of the regulation of marriage in this country. And uh, I know, uh, I think back to an example uh, in my own family uh, where uh, I had a member of my family who lived in uh, the state of Illinois and another member of my family who lived in the state of Tennessee, uh, but, and they were cousins. And under the law of Tennessee at that time and under the, state of, uh, under the law of Illinois in that time, uh, cousins could not marry. But under the law of Kentucky, uh, cousins were permitted to marry. And so those two members of my family went to Paducah, Kentucky uh, to be married. And um, this is, uh, historically, the states have regulated this matter uh, in our country. And um, this is not an unusual example. Uh, states do uh, pl continue to play a major role in the regulation of marriage in our country. Okay. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I would like to say to my... Uh, friend who's obviously an avid uh, fan of the Dallas Cowboys that uh, it, it and I extend hearty congratulations to him and uh, <laughs> right. well as a representative from Pasadena California I should say that we welcome both the Buffalo Bills and the Dallas Cowboys last weekend was spent in California this last and weekend. we appreciate it very much and we were happy to have you there but let me just say that uh, I, I find it interesting we talk about the 110 new members on this side of the aisle are, are, you know, who've come, 47 from this side, 63 from that side. And my friend from Texas continues to talk about how a nearly two-thirds vote was cast, and you say, by this Congress. But you've got to remember this is a new Congress. And we have uh, many more new members than we've had in years. And I think we have to recognize that as we consider waiving the three-day layover provision on this legislation to immediately rush it to the floor. I would hope that we could implement a, um, an open rule. Why? Because there are many members, new members and old members, who, uh, members who have served here before, who would like to uh, have the opportunity to offer amendments to this measure. We have a list of them here. And also I should say that uh, I am a very strong proponent of family and medical leave. Uh, I happen to think that it's a very good provision. But like my friend from Tennessee, the distinguished Republican Chairman Emeritus of this committee, uh, I am opposed to having the federal government mandated. Uh, I looked at a survey the other day, and I wondered if you all would respond to this, showing that 93% of the businesses in this country today offer some form of family and medical leave. And uh, it seems to me that we should do everything that we possibly can to provide a greater incentive for family and medical leave for businesses. This morning on National Public Radio, there was a a very emotional statement from a woman in California who talked about the fact that she had lost her job. 
But it seems to me that when you look at some of these surveys that have been taken, they also included it in this NPR story, uh, there, I believe, is a tremendous potential for discrimination against women of childbearing age when it comes to the prospect of gaining these jobs. I mean, this, this woman on the program this morning said that um, she had been given eight weeks of maternity leave and then she was fired at the end of that eight week period and replaced with a man. Well, the thing that I could see happening with implementation of this legislation is, why hire the woman in the first place? And a survey has shown this, this the, the survey that was outlined in this program today has shown this to be the case. In fact, they said, I think 45% of the businesses indicated that they would not hire women of childbearing age if this legislation is put into place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just, it seems to me that that, that does create a very serious potential problem for it. So I want to see us provide every incentive possible to have a family and medical leave program for businesses. And I want to go from this 93% figure to 100% of businesses offering these programs. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, whoever is telling you that people are going to stop hiring women of age is living in a cave. Well, I was listening to an interview that was on National Public Radio well, this morning. It's on part this. of my job, and has been for many, many years, to look at projections of what the workforce needs of this country are going to be. And I want to tell you, if you haven't uh, discovered it yet, that by the end of this decade, the United States workforce will be more dependent on women than ever in the history of the country, including what people think was our high point in World War II, where we brought people off the farms, females, to work in war plants. Rosie the Riveter is still a romantic uh, notion with people. We actually have more women as a percentage of the workforce today than we had then. By the end of this decade, every employer who wants a good workforce is going to have to be able to attract the best talented workers he can get, and that means women, and that means women who care about their families, and won't work for an employer who doesn't take care of their family. So the problem is going to take care of itself by the end of the decade. We're just trying to catch up with where the American people were 25 years ago and where the rest of the world has been for the last half century. We're behind everybody else. We're running like crazy to catch the tail end of the parade. And by the end of this de decade, I want to tell you, with or without this legislation, People are going to be bidding against each other to get women of childbearing age because a majority of women in the childbearing age now are employed outside the household. Mm -hmm. And trained yeah. women are becoming more and more a premium employee and will be. You've got a choice well, I, between non-English speaking immigrants or training the people who are already well, Bill, here. all I was saying here is that this is information that has come to us from a wide range of businesses. I. Uh, I mean, I think that your case can be a very compelling one as David, far as the potential. I have never met a single small businessman who will stand up at a rotary meeting or a chamber of commerce and respond to the question, is there anybody here who wouldn't give their employees time off if they had a sick spouse, a sick child, uh, a sick family member to attend? And nobody will, in the presence of their peers, say it. Now, there's something strange, because since the president vetoed this bill the last time, some groups, groups oh, okay. come and testify to us that 150,000 people in this country got fired for taking unauthorized leave for a medical emergency. Now, something wrong with that. The individual businessman says that he treats his employees with compassion, and they get time off. And I believe him, because I used to be his lawyer. However, when he joins the NFIB and uh, they pay dues to somebody else to make up their mind for him, it changes into a, an entirely different kind of issue. You try to find in your district a small businessman with 20 employees who says that he would object to his people being covered by the terms of this, and you won't find one. Mm -hmm. It's just that some people will abuse it someplace else. He doesn't think his employees will do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk too much here within the Beltway of the shibboleth of what people believe out there. I've just spent more time this year 
uh, with those people than I have in a good many years. And I found out a lot of the, the baloney that uh, is taken as uh, a given here in Washington is totally invalid in the middle of the USA where I live. The other the bill wants to comment yeah. on this bill. Yeah, let me, let me say several things. One is uh, in conjunction with the 110 new members of Congress. This was, has been a great issue. Uh, for the last eight or nine years, and I'm sure that, that most of those members took a position on it in the campaign. They were either for or against this legislation, and we haven't changed the legislation, so it's not necessary to delay consideration of it. The other point, two other points, one is... A number of them probably had amendments that they maybe yes. thought about during well, the debate process that they might want to have the opportunity to offer here on the House well, floor, that's Bill, the, and I think that's, 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 that's why we're pushing for an open rule. The committee would have to decide whether or not uh, it should be We'd open. like to have your support in our uh, attempt to implement that uh, open rule. My, I support what the chairman of the Education and Labor Committee has, has recommended, and, uh, but it's up to you in the final analysis. But if you think it's difficult to define spouse, try to define uh, uh, a family and medical leave of those 93% of the businesses that you refer to in a survey. First of all, I don't believe it is 93%. In fact, I know it's not 93%, but some may give one day off for childbirth and two days off uh, for adoption, and they call that family and medical leave. The other point that I want to make is that it's very, it's not uh, uncommon for this government or any government to insist on certain minimum standards for living. We do it all the time. They aren't mandated. We mandate a minimum standard. You can go above that. But certainly this government and all other governments decide on, on minimum wages, minimum working conditions, OSHA uh, provisions, uh, all kinds of, of things that that uh, set a minimum standard without being a mandate. Uh, if it was a mandate, I would say that we ought to give it the top uh, of the bracket instead of the low. We say that you've got to, to uh, abide by certain kinds of uh, decent, uh, civilized standards, and that's what government is about. The last point that I wish to make is that apparently some people who, who are interested in defining spouse are also interested in denying some of these provisions for people who are gays. We might as well talk about it. But, in, but uh, there are many marriages of convenience uh, for tax purposes, for all kinds of convenience. So if a lesbian married a homosexual, uh, I assume that it would be all right since they would be spouses for them to, to, to provide uh, or to benefit from the benefits of this uh, this bill and those who want to define spouse as a husband and wife would have no objections to them uh, benefiting from the provisions. If I could just ask a question specifically on the rule here, uh, since we've uh, gotten into the issue very thoroughly, uh, I, I was wondering, uh, Chairman Ford, if you could tell us exactly what you would like to see this committee do. Would you support the idea of our allowing Mr. Goodling to offer his Republican substitute and also a recommittal motion for us? It wasn't really clear in the... I don't think Bill's got a Republican substitute. I think he has a cafeteria. He's got the cafeteria amendment bill. I know. Well, he has a couple of amendments. He just said, would you support the idea of allowing uh, him as the ranking member to offer all the amendments that he would like to, to propose? Or? <laughs> Yeah, we'll be his amendment in the committee. I'm sure we'll be it on the floor. I have no objection to it. Mm -hmm. So you support making those his, order? His amendment, as I recall it, is not the kind of amendment that's offered solely for the purpose of confusing people. It's confusing, but that's not its purpose. I think it's offered in good faith, and I don't have any objection to it. I can't say that about all of the 30 amendments you have before you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep, I think his amendment also calls for uh, some tax monies being uh, uh, granted to the businesses who do grant uh, leave. Is that correct, Mr. Mr. Goodman? Well, I can't offer an amendment of that nature. <coughs> on, on the floor, if this rules committee authorized. I thought I saw Is that the pay as you go amendment? Mm -hmm. uh, I got a letter from Chairman Rostenkowski uh, saying that it would appear that there's an amendment uh, to require waivers of the rule of Germanus and the pay-as-you-go requirements in the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990. Are those your amendments? 
not my idea. That's good. That's good. Randy Orton's amendment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. If, if you look at yeah. uh, Mr. Goodling's, uh, it doesn't require any waiver uh, uh, on the cafeteria plan. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back the balance to my five minutes. <laughs> Mr. Hall. Chairman, I don't have any questions on it. I'm very much in support of what this committee is doing. I think it's an important piece of legislation. I think we all have known families that have suffered as a result of this, not having the time off to spend with their families. I myself, my son had a roommate who just uh, was in the hospital and he his roommate just got married. I think he was about 22, 23 years old and he had cancer. There's not a whole lot of stuff ready to go, and I can't understand why we have to waive the three-day rule, uh, and I uh, will register an objection for that, because I do believe with 25 percent newcomers, even though this may have been uh, debated on the trail, on the campaign, and I'm sure it was in many areas, the ability to be able to listen to your colleagues, have a good intellectual thorough debate on this, is what this place is about in part. And it seems to me there's no reason to forego that in this case. So I would object uh, to uh, waiving the three-day rule. The second area, uh, I want to ask a question, if I may. And, and I, uh, Mr. Bonnier made some very fine points about the need to take all the bumps out that we can in people's lives. And I, I think that's part of what government properly does. In this case, I'm not sure we've got a good assumption. The assumption seems to be that governments can somehow substitute its wisdom here for private business judgment. The idea being that business really has no sense of employer well-being, and therefore government has to come in. There are those who would counter and say government has no business sense. And if you weigh those two together, I think that the evidence over the years is that employers have more concern about the well-being of their employees than government has business sense. Uh, and if you look at the deficit today and you look at the annual deficit and you look at some of the crazy laws that we've passed uh, previously uh, in uh, the United States Congress uh, that have created this mess, uh, I think that you would find a great many Americans would agree that we've got the cart before the horse. My question is specific. We are talking about now something that some have described as the catastrophic Family Health and Leave Act for the very reason it, it will not accomplish what those who are well-intentioned and hope it will accomplish. Uh, and that is that it will force employers to practice a new type of discrimination not a type of capital D discrimination, but a type of screening out what will be the non-productive or the less productive of the employees they have in front of them. Mm. Questions will be asked. Smart people will create profiles. Do you have a mom or a dad that is sick or is about to be sick? Do you have a wife of childbearing age? Those types of questions inevitably are going to be asked because the employer, among other things, is going to have to make a judgment call uh, on the bottom line and his responsibilities, including in that, of course, the question of employee well-being. This, um, in some people's minds, smacks a little bit of the opposite of the work to the rule. Uh, everybody remembers the old labor unions work to the rule, nobody wants to be embarrassed, so we'll all do as little as possible and set the lowest common denominator. Well, if you're an employer, you're trying to overcome that and you want the highest common denominator. And it seems to me that that is what we are doing, is we are encouraging a highest common denominator that is going to leave people out who are going to have needs, rather than allowing the process to work and find a common sense middle road place. My question is this, did the committee do any empirical studies that led to any data on what type of screening will go on and who the losers and who the winners are going to be in this game in the marketplace as we know it now? And that is a specific well, question, and either chairman I'd be honored the to answer. The answer to that is, is simply yes. Uh, there was a compromise reached that uh, reduced the, uh, that increased the number of, of months that you would have to work for the employer before you became eligible for the benefits of this bill. I don't know how somebody can sit and decide uh, at the time he's interviewing an employee, a potential employee, that 12 months from now, his mother or his father or his child is going to become ill. It just doesn't happen that way. But we, we increase the, the amount of time that you had to be on the job from the initial uh, introduction of the bill. 
to 12 months. Chairman Clay, could I ask you, do, do any states in the United States already have a family medical leave uh, uh, plan? Yes. About how many states in the United States have that? 32. And of, of those 32 uh, uh, family medical leave plans that are already in effect, have you heard any kind of uh, response from those that there have been these kind of screenings? No, in fact, in most of the states that already have the uh, the uh, the plans in effect, the business community is happy with with the plans. It actually, uh, many of them contend that it actually saves them money as opposed to costing them money. My state of Tennessee is one of those states, and I have and I have heard of no complaint where women have been discriminated against, no. uh, potentially uh, or uh, employees with potentially um, ill uh, uh, parents. So. From the experience we've had in Tennessee, and I guess from the experience in those other 30-something states, it indicates that that doesn't seem to be a problem. That's correct. I'm very happy to have yielded to my colleague from Tennessee uh, on that point, because I think it's uh, very relevant. Uh, my question to the chairman specifically was, however, have you done any study uh, of screening, efforts that have started or any moves towards screening? Questions like, uh, did your mother or father have a history of uh, cancer? Uh, in their family. Those types of questions which seem benign on the surface but could be used for insidious purposes. Well, Mr. Goss, I, I have to rise to the defense of the American businessmen. Many of them were my clients and sent me to Congress and still vote for me. Uh, I don't perceive that kind of an ethic being widely dispersed across our country. What you're describing here, that people would sit down and scheme to make sure that they weren't going to give a job to somebody who might have a member of their family fall ill. Uh, first of all, I don't think it can be done. The second, there's another problem here that Mr. Gordon got to. If you start off on the theory that an employer is doing a woman a favor by giving her a job, then you can get yourself all tangled up in this business that I won't do that favor if she's likely to take time off for a child. But if you accept the truth of the matter, that you aren't going to be able to run a business or run this place without women in the future. You aren't going to have the luxury of saying when you hire a woman, it's because you want to do her a favor. You hire a woman because she's the best person for the job. Now, when we can get many of our colleagues who are having a hell of a time getting in to the last part, a quarter of this century over those kinds of issues to understand that you're not conferring some kind of a special benefit on a woman by giving her a job, we'll think differently about this and you won't be bothered about things like screening. Nobody's going to screen out women. You heard me tell Mr. Dyer. All the studies we have show that every business in this country that's going to be on its feet at the turn of the century is going to have be more dependent on female workers than it is even today. And I think we'll all be better off. My concern was not screening out. My concern was screening in a competitive basis, and that was what my question was. Given two people who have apparently equal qualifications, will there be uh, either a announced or non-announced process so that those people who will uh, create the employer more discomfort under this legislation proposed that the balance will then be tipped. In other words, are we confounding the very purpose you have just exhibited uh, to us so articulately? That's my may concern. I, may I say, if the gentleman would yield, uh, may I say that, first of all, we're talking about unpaid leave. People will only take it in dire emergencies. And I don't think it's uh, the kind of, uh, of an issue that uh, an employer would be overly concerned about whether or not somebody's going to take off 12 weeks of unpaid time. It, it wouldn't, take off, wouldn't take off unless it was crucial uh, and important to them, very, very important. So I don't think it's the kind of thing that would cause too much concern on the part of a potential uh, uh, Thank you, employer. Mr. Chairman. I've, I've used my time, but uh, there's another question out there, and it's the question of even though we'll debate who pays and there's not much cost at this point in this legislation, I believe that if you follow through to its norm to the end, you'll find there is going to be a cost that's going to have to be passed to somebody, and that is an unresolved question. It may be answered in health care. It may be answered in some other way. But eventually, while that salary is not being made, there is going to be a need for those people to have revenues. What, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to respond to that because Mr. Solomon asked uh, Bill Clay how much it would cost the federal government to give this unpaid leave. 
Mr. Solomon, you may remember that around here for years under the Reagan administration, we've been playing this, this little game with budget reconciliation. You know, one of the ways we commonly save money is we put people out of work for a while and don't pay them or we delay paydays. And any time that federal employees are off without pay, the budget light rings and says, aha, we just made a profit. And the budget will look better for the agency that person is from because the money is appropriated in advance for it and it won't be spent for salary. So every time this is used by a federal employee, it will save you and me as a taxpayer money. And if Mr. Gentleman would yield. Interesting to see if those games continue for the next four years. Yeah. If the gentleman would yield, I can't resist it. it. The answer to his question is it would cost far less than random drug testing. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you just opened up Pandora's box. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to finish the point, and I think it's a good answer, but I think everybody knows that nothing useful is produced by the federal government that is productive or commercial. We're talking about the commercial marketplace, and the employer is going to have to pass the cost on to the consumer, if nothing else, if there are gaps like that where jobs are held open. We're either not going to produce or we're going to have to hire substitute labor. So we've got a problem we're going to have to address. Thank you. Bill, one thing you said, and I don't want you to leave the committee uh, uh, with the mixed feelings on it. When you talked about allowing the Goodling Amendment, some of the Goodling Amendments are, are not germane. Are you no, specifically I, talking about the cafeteria amendment? The, the, we had two amendments offered in the committee. I have three amendments, all of which are I thought the uh, cafeteria plan amendment uh, is one I was referring to. And then uh, you had several on my list, Bill. What's the other two? Oh. That's the only difference. Yeah. There. There's his three. One, two, yeah, delete reference to reduced leave schedule. Is, is that one you're interested in? Three that I have. Yeah, three. Three. Our, hmm. Our council tells us that the only problem is uh, that we might have to offer in block because they amend different, uh, different sections, but that, there is no uh, germane is well, I have no objection to him having the opportunity to uh, offer them. One of his amendments was voted on 14 to 24, the other one 13 to 29. I feel confident that that will be similar to the outcome on the floor, but I don't want to cut off Bill from offering them, and I would certainly uh, think you should make them in order. He's a member of the committee who works hard, and we occasionally not always, but occasionally have disagreements. Here we have a disagreement, and he ought to have his chance to disagree on the floor with the chairman. Would you rather have them on block or individual? All right, whatever Mr. Goodling wants. All right, fine. Whatever Mr. Goodling wants. That's the way it's always well, not quite whatever Mr. Goodling <laughs> wants. Whatever Lolo wants, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Weave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mo most of what needs to be said today has, has already been said. I'd just like to thank the Chairman, uh, Mr. Clay, Mr. Ford, for bringing this bill uh, back to this Congress. Uh, I have heard uh, most of this debate before, and I think those of us who have been here appreciate the fact that uh, very few of the arguments that we have heard here are new. But I think the other side makes a reasonable argument when they point out that there are over 100 new members of Congress, and that no that no, con no previous Congress can bind the hands of any future Congress. We all ought to have the opportunity to uh, adequately debate this bill and to have a major alternative to what the committee is offering on the floor and vote on it up or down. Just as the Congress, uh, past Congress, can't bind the hands of any future Congress, I appreciate the fact that no past president can bind the hands of any future president. And Bill Clinton, having made this one of the key points of his campaign, ought to have the opportunity early on in his administration to address this issue. So I doubly appreciate the fact that the chairman have brought this bill uh, to this committee and intend to take it to the floor the as soon as possible. gentleman yield just a moment? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to yield to my friend from California in just a moment because I, I want to make a, a reference also to a point that you made when uh, you suggested that, and several members on your side of the aisle suggest that you support the concept of this bill, but you don't believe the federal government ought to be mandating these basic rights. Uh, but you went on to, to make a point that I think illustrates why the federal government has to, has to uh, mandate 
uh, rights uh, such as this uh, from time to time when you suggested that if we pass this bill uh, that there might be occasion when employers would not want to hire women of childbearing age unless they had an absolute right to be able to fire them which is what you suggested um, I, I think we ought to make it clear in this society that all people ought to be able to be treated equally hired strictly on the basis of their merit and qualifications and that women in particular should not be discriminated against merely because they are women uh, I believe in, in the concept and the practical impact of this bill that people ought to be able to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave to take care of a, of a newborn child or to take care of an ill family member. I think in a humane society that's the very least we can ask and the federal government ought to apply this minimum standard. If the gentleman and, and, and yield on that point, I would simply friend. say that w what I was trying to say is that the employer should have the ability to offer the kind of family and medical leave program which is most conducive to their operation rather than having it standardized from us. I think that based on this survey, and I'm not just offering my opinion, I'm basing on the survey as I said earlier that I'd heard on the, on the radio this morning, we create an opportunity for these businesses to say, why should I hire someone of childbearing age? Uh, and, that's, and, and, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. And if, if, when, if, I, when I asked my friend Neil earlier, I was, just, I was just going to say that, that my friend has made an extraordinarily compelling case by saying we should have free debate on this issue for an open rule, and I hope that he'll support our, our uh, request for that. Well, I, I said very clearly that I'd su su support the opportunity for this bill to go to the floor and for there to be a major alternative to this bill. I, I do think well, that you your, said a free debate. I, I, I do think your side of the rule. aisle deserves that. Uh, I would also... I would also suggest to the gentleman uh, that he, he is, um, he's made the point that, that he believes that uh, there ought to be opportunity for businesses to design their own family and or medical leave. And I think the gentleman is right. We are setting only very minimal standards here. And I think facing the kind of labor situation that the two chairmen have referred to we may face in the future, that many businesses will, be go, will go beyond these minimal standards that are being established. And there is nothing in this legislation to present it. But there is also nothing wrong with the federal government setting minimal standards for our society. And that's what this bill does. It all depends on what your interpretation of minimal standards are. Let me just quickly add my thanks and congratulations to Chairman Ford and Chairman Clay for their patience in bringing this bill before us over the last several years. I think it's been demonstrated their patience has resulted in a bipartisan agreement. It's resulted in bringing liberals and conservatives and moderates together to a bill that has received uh, well over a majority vote on a number of occasions. Uh, and although even your most... Um, of uh, vocal opponents will always preface that it's a good idea. They just don't like this little piece or that little piece. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, history has demonstrated when this program has been implemented in, in over 30 states in the, here in, in our United States and every other industrialized country in the world that those potential hypothetical maybe this could happen uh, cases really don't pan out. There's a very simple question before us, uh, and that question is whether or not we feel that those individuals working in businesses over, over 50 employees should have the right to unpaid leave for up to 12 weeks for the, an illness in their family. That's the, that's the very simple question before us. Either you're for that or you're against it. And, and, you, and be, you know, if you want to be against it, that's perfectly fine. But there's no other question before us. That's the simple question. That's the vote tomorrow. We need to get on with it. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman, I don't think I've ever been as frustrated in my life to be the last speaker this morning <laughs> because although I think that probably mirrors life, doesn't it, ladies? Um, but uh, let me be specific right up front. There's probably nothing more that aggravates the American woman than having a bunch of men sitting around in suits deciding what's best for the poor souls because they don't know. <laughs> now, let me, let me first say I've seen some of those statistics too, David, on the cost of this bill. But if you really extrapolate those out, every man, woman, and child in America would have to be pregnant every nine months to achieve anywhere near the kind of costs that are attached to that. And I, let me guarantee you that's not going to happen. Let me tell you something, gentlemen. Women work out of necessity. 
They work out of pure necessity. The buying power of the American family, we all know, has not risen. They don't have any choice. I have a daughter who's very highly educated and does well and spends a third of her income on daycare, would have loved to stay home with her child until he was ready for kindergarten. She had no option there. She had to do it in order to meet the needs of that family and make sure the two children that they were able to have could be fed and clothed. They're not doing it because they're trying to buy another Cadillac or, please dispel yourself of that notion. Nor are they concerned as all of you are today, and I know they're heartened to know that you want to make sure that they're treated fairly, that they're treated well, and that they're not going to be not hired. Let me tell you, women in this country have never been treated fairly. It took us, I think when I first started running for office in the early 1970s, every woman in this country was paid 59 cents on the dollar for every man who had the same job she had with the very same education. There hasn't been a whole lot of cry about that. Nothing unfair. And any woman will tell you that as soon as she achieves some little piece through the glass ceiling and goes into one section of business, which has always been highly regarded and well paid because it was male dominated, changes. And then the salaries begin to fall because it's women. And whether it is subliminal or what it is, it is real. Women are not treated the same way in the workplace. At the same time, society says to the woman, you are the caretaker. It's your job. So you have these children, they're your responsibility. We know you have to work, but try to find some place for daycare and try to find somebody around who will take them in if they're sick at school or if you have to go somewhere for your parents. And now on top of that, you have your parents to take care of as well as your husband's parents. And that's the sandwich generation. So all right, we've got this poor American woman who first has to work out of necessity. And many of them work because they want to because they're superbly educated and they should. This woman, if she has children, is really the total responsibility almost for those children because they're the ones who take care of the sick child. They're the ones who make sure the child is fed and clothed. And Lord knows that their husbands help provide the money to do that, but the actual work and the time spent on that, plus cleaning the house, is done by the woman of the house. And she has all the rest of these problems, and now we're saying in the United States, the only country in the world that's industrialized, we're sorry, sister, we can't give you a little while off to have this baby. Now, if somebody could explain to me why it is beneficial to business in America for the race to stop, I want to hear it. Why don't we want people to have babies so we can have future customers? We don't, but I sure don't understand it. A lot of these women are single mothers, and a lot of these men are men who are raising children by themselves. So you're not just talking about women here. You're talking about a man who has the responsibility of seeing that his child's health needs are met. Now, we had another little issue here a few years ago about where women were ever going to be hired again. Johnson Controls and the battery problems. So we found that women who worked in these parts of industry, that the reproductive systems were not doing well and that, that they had to quit. So business is all right. The best way to do this, we'll never hire one of them again. We'll just keep them out of here. We don't have any problem with their reproductive systems. And then, just like with DES, some smart person said, hey, wait a minute. What about the men? How do we know their plumbing is not affected? And suddenly there was a whole different attitude in the country of what we were going to do about that. Sure, we need this bill. A lot of the women who were killed in the fire in North Carolina, a lot of them, were working there because they had lost better paying jobs and jobs where they had a future because they had to take some time off when a parent had a stroke or a child was critically ill. But I'll tell you the most important thing I remember when we started this debate seven years ago, and that was, I was just first here, and Chairman Clay said something that stuck with me for all my life, and I want you to listen up. When Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, there were people all over the country saying, this is very bad for the small slaveholder. Let's come a little bit beyond that now and say that we can give compassionate leave for people who have sick children. But one other point, everybody wants empirical evidence. Here it is. 1990 of October, done for the U.S. Small Business Administration by the United States of America. This, this is a government survey done by two economists, one from Connecticut, one from Cornell. What did it mean in the states where they had leave? Well, let me quote just a couple of things here. They experienced neither serious increase in cost nor difficulty in administering and implementing the legislation, uh, according to the Family and Work Institute, borne out by this survey. This was the first comprehensive survey that studied the specific effects on employers. 
Um, and it, they said that um, in each state that has the law said the cost for health benefits, training, unemployment insurance, and administrative duties had not increased as a result of the legislation. Half the employers surveyed in Rhode Island, Oregon, and Minnesota, and Wisconsin said it was extremely or moderately easy to implement. When asked how they replace employees on leave, the top choice of, of employers is across the four states. Uh, said that they assigned the work temporarily to other uh, employees, and in addition, uh, some 28% said they used outside temporary replacements. But they didn't have the difficulties that they expected, and in one business where eight women had taken leave a year after their law passed, only one did not return to her job. Now, there was a bank in Oregon that said uh, they had one little minor addition, the overall turnover rates. They only had one difficulty in this one bank, which is a pretty small business. The branch manager and an assistant branch manager took leave at the same time. Overall, the bank official said the law is good for business and worth its weight in gold with respect to the parent-child relationship. That's the most basic family value we've got. And if we find that, that business, and I don't believe it for a minute, let me stand up for American business too, it's stronger than that. It's better than that. And if a couple of employees during a year takes 12 weeks off to take care of something seriously wrong, and I agree with both Ford and Clay, it's very unlikely anybody can take unpaid leave uh, for a day longer than they have to have it. Then surely to goodness, if we really care about that, if we want these children born and adopted and with some start off in life, we have to have some cognizance of what it's like, again, for that woman I was talking to you about a while ago. Because if you still have some sense that they're all really running around to the PTA in the afternoon and playing bridge at the club, forget it. That's not life in America anymore. Surely, to goodness, the least we can do is pass this bill. Would the gentleman lady yield? Absolutely. I, I agree with the goals you're trying to accomplish. The issue here is do we need to mandate it? Yes. Okay. Would we mandate it to the United States Congress also? Will we oh, live yes. by these rules? Absolutely. 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 I, actually, I've been practicing it since I've been here. Good. Thank you very uh, much. Can, can I ask my friend just one sure. question to follow up on that? All right. Do you believe that implementation of this legislation creates any potential for discrimination against women? Well, uh, let me just tell you that in business, I have, in, in all this survey, there's no indication there at all that people say, if women are going to have babies, we're just not going to do right. it. Well, it's just, I mean, there are all these different surveys, and the only one that I brought up was the one that I heard referred to on this radio program this morning. And that's the thing that concerns me, is whether or not we are going to create mm -hmm. a climate which will encourage businesses to discriminate against women. I want to do everything that I possibly no. can to ensure that women are not discriminated against. I'll tell you. Well, don't worry about it then. You, that you're worried. Well, I am worried about it. Let me, well, let me I give sincerely you. am concerned about it, Louise. David, I, well, I'm sure you're sincere. But the thing is that if you really look at small, uh, not larger businesses, the companies like IBM, Eastman Kodak, and others, who are going out of their way to institute daycare because mm -hmm. they know as a matter of fact, I think it's IBM or Time Magazine, one of the major corporations in New York City, has what they call sick child care. And so that their employee can get to work, they send a nurse out to take care of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they understand that it, what Bill Ford said is absolutely true. The workforce is shifting in this country, and it's changing heavily toward female. I don't know whether it's because it's cheaper or not. I hope not. But Let, that's the fact. If, if I could just say for the record, with all due respect to Chairman Ford and Chairman Clay, I believe that Louise Slaughter makes a more compelling case than either of the two of you. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> that's the way women are. That's why I just hated to get to it. I think I, I felt like you all were wasting all your time here this morning. <laughs> that you need to hear from a woman. And I, and I will also make you another promise. Being pregnant is not fun. And uh, let me assure you, on behalf of all the women in America, that they're not going to overdo that. <laughs> you bet. I gotta go make a speech. I'll do it alone. <laughs> All right. Maybe we can get out of here quickly. Mr. Chairman, if uh, ever there was a time for an opportunity to offer amendments, it certainly is on this legislation. I don't, uh, I don't do things uh, 
in a dilatory fashion. I don't offer things in committee to delay things. Uh, I offer things to try to improve uh, what it is we're going to vote into legislation. And as I said in committee, it's obvious this bill is going to be legislation within perhaps two weeks. Uh, will be on the present desk, will be signed. So the important thing is, I think, to make it as good as we possibly can make it. And if there are any glitches, we should look at those glitches. And I'm referring to three uh, that I think are necessary. I would hate to have three hours and 20 minutes of debate. <laughs> Let's see, how long have I been here this morning on the floor of the House? Uh, and for no purpose, because we have no amendments to offer or cannot offer amendments. Uh, well, there's a purpose, but no purpose that's going to make the legislation any better. So I would ask that I have an opportunity to offer three separate amendments uh, with the idea of improving the bill. Uh, the first is a cafeteria plan. When I offered this, uh, I couldn't believe anybody could vote against it because it sounded to me like it was a win-win proposition. Because what I say in that cafeteria plan is that an employer is exempt if the employer offers a cafeteria plan which includes this legislation or better than what we offer in this legislation. So I couldn't see how that could be anything other than win-win. Now the argument you will hear is they'll say, uh, yeah, but we're setting a minimum standard. But we're really not setting a minimum standard. We're setting a minimum standard for 40-some percent of the employees out there. And we're telling the other 50-some percent that you're not as good as the 40 percent because you're not covered by this bill. So we can't say we're setting a minimum standard for employees. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me, if you offer a cafeteria plan, if the father, for instance, is working where they offer, uh, they offer insurance, uh, medical insurance, and he covers the family for medical insurance, uh, the mother of the family may be working for another employer and she may say that, gee, what I want is child care. And if there is a cafeteria plan there that she can choose child care, 73% when we polled them last year indicated that this would not be their first choice. It would be a choice in a cafeteria plan. So I feel that you're offering them the best of all worlds. Uh, you're giving the employee the opportunity to take 12 weeks of leave if they wish, but you're also giving that employee an opportunity to take something that may be more important to them. So I would offer that amendment and hope that it would be made in order. The second one is reduced leave schedule. Now we said a lot today about uh, uh, the bill being as it always has been and therefore it's no use discussing or debating it. This is one section that is different, uh, you will notice. Uh, in the bill as it came out of my committee, uh, for the first time in any bill that has ever been presented to committee or in the Congress, we say that the employer does not have an opportunity to participate in determining reduced leave schedule. This is the first time that we have ever done that. Uh, every other bill that came, including the one that was passed last year and vetoed, uh, gave that employer that opportunity. I don't know why it was removed other than I think they probably thought that an employer somehow or other could abuse that participation when you talk about intermittent leave or reduced leave. But the way the bill is also written, which is included, which is new, that cannot happen because they make it very, very clear that the employer cannot abuse uh, this opportunity. But if we don't look at this and if we don't change it, uh, let me tell you what it means. Uh, the employee may take both reduced leave schedule and intermittent leave so long as medically necessary. And as I indicated under all prior versions, it always said uh, approved by the employer. It now creates this possibility. Uh, if you, s you say they have this opportunity, an employee could now demand that he or she be allowed to work four hours a day, every day for six months, or six hours every other day for nine months, or whatever choice they have, and the employer could not have anything to say about that whatsoever. It would be a bookkeeping nightmare, I think, but I also think it would be very, very difficult to try to run a business. And so I think we have to look at the fact that this was never part of the bill in previous uh, discussions. And so I would ask that I could offer that amendment. The third amendment that I would ask that I could offer is the key employer exemption, key employee exemption. 
in the bill we basically say that a key employee is only someone who is in the top 10 percent as far as salary is concerned now as I look at a lot of businesses, the key employees are not necessarily, in fact, they'd like to reduce some of those, and many of businesses are now, because they aren't key employees. Uh, but here, the only key employee is in the top. Now, if you look at someone who has security clearance, for instance, not in the top 10%, you have a defense contract, and it must be out in four weeks' time. Uh, is that not a key employee, and shouldn't that be a discussion? Or if you have the health and safety of your employees and you have a reduced workforce in the health and safety area, should you not be considering that uh, as a key employee? Because, of course, the health and safety of all your employees is very, very important. So I would ask uh, an opportunity to offer those as uh, three separate amendments uh, because I believe that we really should do everything we can to make sure the bill is as good as it possibly can be uh, when we uh, when it becomes law. Well, you heard the chairman say that he had no objection to those three amendments, and if he has no objection, I have I'd like to offer amendments. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Bill, I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the opening part of your, uh, your testimony. Uh, Mr. Ford had requested uh, three hours and 20 minutes total, and you heard the breakdown. Is that satisfactory? Is well, what I had indicated to the chairman was that I hope we didn't stand up there and go three hours and 20 minutes like this morning if we're not going to do anything to try to improve the bill. Uh, we don't need three hours and 20 minutes just to talk. Uh, every, everybody's done that. What we need is some time to improve the bill, and that's why I asked for three separate amendments. Well, there have been uh, 30 amendments filed, and uh, uh, again, uh, this week, since the Select Committee uh, bill has been pulled from the floor, uh, if we were to spend three hours and 20 minutes of, on this bill uh, tomorrow and say two or three hours the next day on the so-called motor voter bill, it means that we would have been in session on the floor about six hours uh, for this, uh, this week. Uh, that's why uh, our Republican leader, Bob Michael, has asked for an open rule. Uh, the 30 amendments that have been offered, if we were to allow 20 minutes on each, which would be customary, it means that we would we would spend about uh, maybe five hours at the most on this legislation, uh, which would seem to be reasonable to us. So we we certainly were going to try to get a um, an open rule so that the Congress can work its will on the floor. And well, I, my you don't object to that. My preference, of course, would be that because I think that's a better way to spend your debate time than just to have people stand up and make speeches. I think if you are specifically debating certain issues, it's more meaningful, at least to the public, than it is just to hear speeches. Well, Bill, thank you, and thank you for the great job you do in, uh, as the ranking Republican on that committee. May I say that the most important thing that's happening this morning that should be taking my time, far more important than this, is the reauthorization of the elementary secondary programs, and we're having our first hearing uh, at this time, but that's going to be far more important. Than Get over there and do your good work. Mr. Quillen. And everybody else hit and run. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill Goodland, I appreciate the good work you do, not only on this bill, but through all uh, legislation that has come to the floor of the House. You're a good member of this body. I share your concern that we're spending more time spinning our wheels doing nothing than we are getting down to the nitty-gritty of what we really need to do on the floor of the House is to reduce our deficit, take care of our national debt if possible, and do the things to uh, solve our national health crisis and spur our economy to greater heights. But we're not doing that. The uh, partisan side of the aisle is uh, just going to bring up these measures that have been vetoed and the vetoes have stained and, uh, and put the other on the back burner. Hopefully that's not the way it will be. But we're leading in that direction. But I commend you. I'm opposed to the bill because of the federal mandate. And some of the arguments made for the bill, to me, doesn't ring true. But we'll see what the situation of the 110 new members will uh, be expressed on the floor. And, and I'm anxious to get on with it. So I'll cut my remarks short. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much.
just kind of like to put into the record a, a letter from Chairman Darren Rostenkowski. Uh, dear Mr. Chairman, it's come to my attention that several members may propose amendments to HR 1, the Family Medical Leave Act of 1993, which would require waivers from House Rules uh, 21.5b, in addition to what it appear that these amendments would also require waivers of the rules of local germaneness and the page of government requirements of the Budget Enforcement Act. In order to ensure that the revenue legislation is in regular order and that the rules of the House be observed, I respectfully request that these amendments not be made in order. And also I'd like to submit a letter from the Secretary of Labor, Mr. Robert Reich, uh, asking us, uh, this committee, to uh, work quickly. The uh, next witness will be the Honorable Tom Petrie of uh, Wisconsin. The chair will recognize the Honorable Maj Rakhmar. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appear before you this morning as the ranking Republican on the Labor Management Subcommittee. As you know, I have worked a long, long and hard to enact the Family and Medical Leave Bill. I support it. And in so doing, I have made every effort over time to provide both maximum flexibility and numerous protections against abuse in order to deal with the legitimate concerns of the business community. And there were a number initially. In other words, I want this legislation to work and to be enforceable with the least administration or bureaucratic impediments as possible. But as we move to actually make this bill the law of the land, as I expect it will be, it is more important than ever that we be sure that it effectively accomplishes its intended purposes. And to that end, I have before you an amendment to the section of the bill which defines the term health care provider. H.R. 1 now defines health care provider as a doctor of medicine or osteopathy who is authorized to practice medicine or surgery by the state in which the doctor practices. Or, and this is an important change in this version of the bill, or any other person determined by the Secretary of Labor to be capable of providing health care services. That's the bill as currently written. The bill provides, in my opinion, excessive discretion to the Secretary with regard to the designation of who is a health care provider. While providing virtually no guidance as to the factors that the secretary should consider when making such a designation. This creates in my mind, uh, in, in my considered judgment, an unnecessary administrative procedure and which, one which is contradictory to the discretion of state laws. The significance of this broad authority becomes even more evident when one considers that the bill allows employers to require a health care provider's medical certification as the employee's need for leave. This is one of the protections we've all agreed on a bipartisan basis should be in the bill. In fact, the bill's certification provisions are among the key safeguards included in the bill to address the legitimate concerns of the business community against possible abuses. I would note that um, when the Education and Labor Committee favorably reported the bill in the 102nd Congress, there was no mention made whatsoever of granting the Secretary uh, this discretion. And I believe that's as it should be. Um, why are we providing this discretion to the Department of Labor? I don't know. All I know is that the language appears in the bill, well, appeared in the bill at the insistence of the Senate, and I think nobody really thought through what that meant at that time. Uh, Frank, but anyway, in any case, we are here now, and I brought it up to the chairman, Mr. Ford's attention, in committee last week, and Mr. Uh, Ford, the chairman, at that time correctly made a point that under certain circumstances might warrant the involvement of a health care provider other than a licensed doctor. And I think that the chairman made a valid point. However, that does not lead one to the conclusion that 
one should now give discretion to the Secretary of Labor. So my amendment is quite simple with what is the original intent of everybody on our committee, and I'm, as I understand it, certainly the intent of the Senate when they put this in. The amendment merely requires that any individual that should be considered a health care provider under this bill, other than a doctor, must be licensed by the state in which the individual provides the services for health care services. It simply accomplishes a number of important goals. First, it recognizes that situations may exist that warrant alternative means of, devel of delivering health care. Second, it recognizes the rights of the states to decide within their borders who is licensed for such purposes. And third, it maintains the integrity of the bill's certification safeguards. Finally, and most importantly, it provides some assurance that under this bill, any medical treatment is being delivered by licensed professionals in that state. I, my greatest concern, of course, was the question of why give this discretion to the Secretary of Labor, not all, who has questionable knowledge or authority, and secondly, uh, creating another level of administration and bureaucracy for the businesses to deal with when they determine the certification. I know that uh, as of yesterday, President Clinton evidently seems to be consistent with this perspective in terms of his a statement to the National Governors Association in which he has now assured the governors that uh, he supports their interests in maximum flexibility in dealing with health care and Medicaid by giving uh, them maximum latitude to determine Medicaid delivery under the rules of their own state. So I think it's, it's a direction in which I think national policy is going in any case, and it's the cleanest, least disruptive, least bureaucratic system to accomplish all our purposes of responsible licensed health care providers being involved in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. <laughs> Chairman, let me first of all commend uh, Mrs. Rokema for the good job that she does on, on, the, on the committee. Uh, your two amendments uh, are No, I have, excuse me, I should have clarified that. I have only one. There were two variations. The only one, the only one that we are considering is the one that leaves the designation to the, the states and removes, removes the Secretary of Labor okay. from the process. I'm sorry, I should have clarified that at the beginning. There are not two amendments, there is only one. That's what I wanted to get clarified, yes. because we have two listed for you. Uh, it, well, that one is germane, and it doesn't require no any waivers, and uh, no. uh, Mr. Ford uh, and Mr. Clay certainly shouldn't have any, uh, any objection to it, uh, so that we would hope that we could make your amendment uh, in order. You're right. Um, President Clinton uh, did tell the governors uh, that he wants to give more say to the, to the states uh, and cut down on the red tape. Your amendment certainly leads to that, mm -hmm. and you deserve the right to offer it on the floor. Thank, Thank you. you. What was your vote in committee? I don't believe we. I don't believe we voted on this in committee. We had a dialogue and on it a debate. Oh. Is that correct? There was no. Uh, we uh, we agreed that there were mutual purposes served here, but the secretary, but the chairman. I'm sorry, the chairman did not at that time agree with my position. Um, and we agreed that we would explore it further. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> well, what it, well we, no, we, we haven't worked it out. Uh, and, and I don't quite know why, Mr. Chairman. No, the, uh, the only reason I bring that up, I thought maybe Mr. Solomon knew something I did, is that where well. the chairman wouldn't disagree with uh, the bill going forward, the, your amendment going forward. That evidently is not the case. I do not know that. Okay. I do not know that. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, <laughs> the point I was trying to make that uh, based on Mr. Uh, President Clinton's statement to the governors that he should not object because it, fo it is following in line with his philosophy. So I'm sure Mr. Ford, a strong supporter of President Clinton, would not object. He really knows how to stretch things, doesn't he? Huh? I think he sounds perfectly reasonable how does and logical feel to me. About it? <laughs> Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no statement except to congratulate the gentlelady from New Jersey for the fine job that she does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
offer an amendment to, I think, better accomplish the purpose of the act before you, which is to do the best we can of reconciling the competing demands of the world of work and of family life. And uh, the bill is different than the bill that uh, was voted on uh, by the Congress two years ago in one important respect, and that is, so far as coverage of the uh, a bill is concerned, uh, the provisions were changed so that if the Fair Labor Standards Act conflicts, mandates the Fair Labor Standards Act conflict with the mandates of the Family and Medical Leave Act that's before us, the mandates of the Family and Medical Leave Act will take precedent and people uh, who are covered will be able to take intermittent leave and not fall afoul of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, I think uh, my amendment would seek to broaden that and make it clear that this uh, uh, pay docking rule that's been uh, determined by the courts recently under the Fair Labor Standards Act and by the Labor Department uh, would, uh, uh, across the board, take presence to the spirit of the Fair Labor uh, of, of, uh, Standards Act. Let me explain. The pay docking rule prohibits employers from providing salaried workers with unpaid leave on a partial pay basis, on a partial day basis. If such leave is made available or provided to a salaried employee, the employer's exemption under the federal overtime law is nullified and the employer is liable for overtime pay to that employee and to all of the other salaried employees. In some cases, the liability extends retroactively for up to three years. So that prevents flexibility in the workplace uh, where salaried uh, employees are uh, uh, involved. H.R. 1 provides a partial fix which exempts leave taken under the Family and Medical Leave Act from the pay docking rule. So we recognize we want to promote the flexible arrangements. However, this narrow exemption still fails to address the need for flexibility in numerous other situations such as employers with fewer than 50 employees, employees uh, wishing to take time off to address the needs of a child who does not have a serious medical condition but who still could benefit from uh, the parent being involved, and employees who need family leave but who've exhausted the 12 weeks provided under H.R. 1, or employees who want to take on paid leave to preserve paid leave benefits, uh, which, which is a, an option that uh, wouldn't uh, uh, exist. Moreover, this partial fix results in several anomalies under Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, for example, an employer with more than 50 employees is required to provide partial day unpaid medical leave to salaried employees, but an employer with less than 50 employees is prohibited from doing the very same thing that we're requiring of people with more than uh, 50 employees. My amendment re would remove this block to workplace flexibility. In addition to providing prospective relief, the amendment would eliminate the enormous liability already incurred in the public and private sector by employers who have run afoul of the pay docking rule by having flexible leave policies. Uh, and I'd urge the committee to make the amendment in order. I'd note that my colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Penny, uh, is uh, supporting a similar amendment. And I'm being joined in uh, concurring uh, 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 supplemental opinion uh, in the committee report by my colleague on the committee, Mr. Andrews from uh, New Jersey, in supporting uh, this approach. It would require a waiver uh, because uh, uh, of, uh, it uh, uh, affects the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, and therefore uh, uh, would be outside the strict technical scope of the uh, bill, but does not infringe on another committee's jurisdiction. Uh, it came up before the committee and uh, the point of order was uh, 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 sustained and I'm not contesting that. I do agree it does require a point of order. I, it is a subject I think that uh, uh, is uh, regarded as a serious subject and one that we probably ought to address. Uh, there's some concern about whether to do it right now in this legislation or at some other time. And I uh, would just urge that uh, we all know how things slide around here and finding an appropriate vehicle to, to make a needed change uh, is sometimes difficult. Here, this bill does make this needed change uh, for employers, employees of uh, in concerns with 50 or more uh, co-workers, but it doesn't affect the rest of the workforce. And it seems to me if we're trying to help uh, promote flexibility and accommodate the uh, leave for uh, employees, we ought to do that as broadly as we possibly can. Good. This time I'd like unanimous consent to uh, submit for the record a statement uh, from OMB 
on HL1. Did you see it? It's a switch. Yeah. But uh, any questions of Mr. Petrie? <clears throat> Tom, let me uh, just say that because your amendment has strong bipartisan support uh, on both sides of the aisle, uh, certainly I think we ought to make it in order or uh, the Penny Amendment. It, uh, it really wouldn't make too much difference other than pride of authorship. No, I'm perfectly we... willing to yield to uh, right. that so, suggestion. Well, Hopefully we could, and uh, if you can encourage Mr. Penny to come and make the same presentation, we'll, we'll try to take care of it. No uh, statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, but my congratulations on the fine job you do, Tom. Thank you, sir. Mr. Garth. Thank you. Now, that, that is long a farewell, Mr. Chairman, but it's quite natural for people to go with a short A. Yeah, to uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, this amendment uh, deals with coverage of Congress. And although, uh, to a degree, this bill covers Congress, to a very important degree it does not, and I'm referring to the judicial remedies, which I've always felt, and I think most uh, labor law people believe to be terribly important in regard to the enforcement of place of employment labor laws. Congress, as we all know, is often termed uh, the last plantation. That's not my nomenclature, but unfortunately, as we all know, Congress does indeed exempt itself, either partially or wholly from a variety of, of very important labor laws. Congress is wholly exempted, for instance, from the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and a variety of other measures. In recent years, Congress has, as I mentioned already, partially, and I emphasize the word partially, placed ourselves under the coverage of some laws, including recently, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We're under the Fair Labor Standards Act, but we all know we, under our rules, uh, diluted the rules in such a way that everybody is exempted so that we don't have overtime problems, for instance, which all of private enterprise has. So in effect, we really exempt ourselves from the Fair Labor Standards Act. But we do have, we do have, uh, Aris, we do have uh, enforcement provisions and appeal provisions in the bill. Uh, yes, yes, I, I'm getting to that, Mr. Oh, okay. Chairman. Uh, it should be noted, however, that whether we're talking about congressional coverage under the Civil Rights Act, under Fair Labor Standards, and the American, uh, Disabil uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, that members of Congress are exempted from being subjected to any of the judicial remedies. And I emphasize judicial remedies. H.R. 1 continues this kind of a trend of the exemption of Congress of the laws we pass by providing that the remedies and procedures under the Fair Employment Practices Resolution under the House rules shall alone be applied to any House employees who may feel that a violation of H.R. 1 has occurred. In effect, therefore, the members of the House become prosecutor, judge, and jury of all complaints made by their aggrieved House employees. And I would submit that it would be absolutely unthinkable that private business, let's say IBM, could dispose of such complaints under this law in-house, uh, dispose of complaints of their employees. In the private sector, the bill allows all covered employees to file a, uh, a suit, a civil suit, including a jury trial for damages for any of the myriad potential violations of the act. And let me bring out that this is a very arcane law. Un, uh, nothing in the states is anything like it. Fifty pages of very arcane law, uh, including various forms, for instance, insofar as uh, judicial remedies are concerned, of retaliatory discrimination uh, against the employer by any employee who uh, may take advantage of the law and then feel as though he was retaliated against by the employer. So there are important discrimination uh, provisions. And damages would also include recovery of wages, salary, employment benefits, other compensation denied or lost, plus interest, liquidated damages, equitable relief, including employment, reinstatement of employment, promotion, fees and costs, and of course, mandated legal fees upon the employer. 
Now, it's my feeling that the employees of Congress, and there are some 12,500, deserve no less protection than their counterparts in the private sector, and I should say in the local government sector, too, and uh, in states. My amendment would simply allow an employee who feels that he or she has been wronged under the provisions of this act and who is unsatisfied by the decision in-house, which are, I understand, basically secret, and, uh, but, but be that as it may, if one is, uh, is dissatisfied with the in-house treatment, uh, then one would, under my amendment, be able to go on to federal court and to bring a member of Congress, or in instances of committees, for instance, the ranking uh, member and also the chairman, into court, just as all other employees, uh, employers of this nation would be so subjected. I believe that this amendment avoids possible constitutional issues. People have brought that up. But there is no separation of powers problem because we have removed the Department of Labor from being involved in the, in the process. So there is no separation of powers uh, problem. Uh, there is, uh, some have mentioned the speech and debate clause, which I have never felt was a problem insofar as hiring and firing and promoting and employee rights within the, the office sector, for instance. But I do bring out that the senior specialist in American constitutional law at the Congressional Research Service has stated, and I'll just uh, uh, he has given this opinion, and I'll just uh, cite it, uh, quote it. This issue has occasioned much debate. That is the question about the speech and debate defense, which theoretically a member of Congress can bring up when we do speech and w when we do give s speeches and when we do debate, such I, as I am doing right now, for instance. But it is not, it is not possible to make this uh, person states a definitive determination on the basis of constitutional text and its history, structure, and purposes, and the judicial precedents are not dispositive. However, the text as informed by the interpretive judicial decisions does rather strongly suggest that the courts would sustain the validity of the enactment should Congress choose to take the step. And uh, I, I emphasize uh, the fact that, um, that Congress basically has a very uh, much recognized right to indeed interpret for themselves uh, what the constitutional rights may or may not be. The point I want to stress is the fact that all of the, the, few, the few cases that have uh, been, uh, been tried uh, not recognize the, any type of a defense insofar as place of employment rules and regulations and hiring and firing is concerned. And I think it's awfully important that we make it very, very clear that uh, Congress is more than willing to draft this legislation so that we are not exempted from uh, those very important provisions which does uh, allow the, some 12,500 employees at the House if they wish, if they feel they have not been treated fairly in the House process, whereas I've said we're, we're prosecutor, judge, and jury, that they can uh, go and have a trial de novo, jury trial if they wish, uh, uh, in court. And that's what the amendment does do. I would hope eventually that we'd recognize that this should be the same way. We should have the same situation in regard to the Civil Rights Act and the American Disabilities Act, because there again, we have uh, uh, damages and potential lawsuits that are costly, but we, in our wisdom and judgment, have said this is important for these laws, that they have the judicial remedies and that mode of enforcement. We ought to feel just as strongly that that's important, maybe even more so, because there are some of us here in Congress who, who have kind of strained uh, normal uh, regulations of uh, demeanor and conduct, uh, in uh, the handling of their office. Uh, and we ought to therefore stand up to the nation and say, we believe this is good. This bill is going to pass. We believe it's sound and so forth. I'm not arguing the merits any longer. Simply saying that we ought to say that all of the provisions that are quite substantial here about being dragged into federal court, being subjected to suit and all that, and the potential damages, retaliatory discharge, all these things that can come about if one believes that an employer has not been fair with the employees, that we're ready to stand up 
can be subject, subjected to the very same remedies which we're asking all of America's private and indeed public, state, and local governments to also accept. And that's what the amendment does. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Chairman, let me uh, apologize to my good friend Harris Faywell for missing his uh, pork uh, busters uh, luncheon the other day. As you know, we were tied up on the floor uh, for an extended period of time over the uh, uh, extended select committees. Otherwise, I would have been there, but I understand it was a great success. Uh, what was on the menu? Hmm? What was on the menu? Pork. Pork. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, Harris, I certainly agree with you. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, just aggravates the American people out there is uh, Congress passing laws that affect them but don't affect the Congress itself. Uh, we have a similar situation. Uh, just for example, uh, there was a great hue and cry over letting the, the delegates from the territories uh, cast votes on the floor of Congress. Uh, for that same reason. We have a, a motor voter bill coming up on Thursday in which uh, those delegates will be able to come to the floor, cast votes, which will mandate additional costs to local governments and to states without affecting the territories. And this is the same sort of thing. So you, your points are so well taken. Uh, I just hope that, uh, that your amendment can be made in order. It is a germane amendment, uh, and certainly the House ought to be able to work its will. Well, I, I would hope so, too. It's always hard to go back home. I have a town hall meeting coming up this weekend. And whatever I say, I, I wasn't allowed to even get the opportunity to at least present the amendment so they can go up or down and accept the will of the body. I realize that the Rules Committee has certain procedures and, and uh, views on this matter, but uh, this is something that I think that the American people, 95% uh, of them would say, absolutely, this ought to be determined by the members of Congress on the floor of, co of the Congress. And to be denied the right to just have that chance is, is tough. Uh, but I would hope that, uh, that I would be allowed to have that opportunity. And I think there are people from both sides of the aisle that feel the way I do on this matter. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions, but my commendation for the good job that you do. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The reason I asked the question I did of uh, the previous uh, panel when the chairman were there and was assured that, uh, and I believe the exact words were, quote, we are covered. When I asked this question, the two members, and I believe the chairman said uh, words to that effect or those specific words uh, with regard to the employees on the Hill, the reason I asked the question was because I had read Mr. Faywell's amendment and it appeared to me to hit the mark exactly um, in the middle. There are people all over this country saying, how can Congress possibly justify exempting itself from the rules that it passes for the rest of us mere mortals uh, in this country? What is going on in Washington? Now I learn that we haven't completely covered ourselves. In fact, we have a judicial re remedy uh, exclusion. And that is different, and that is wrong. If that is the truth, and that is the way it's going to be, and we're not going to let Mr. Faywell's amendment come to the floor, then at least let us tell the people of the United States of America that this is a partial exemption again, because in fact it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Thank you. The Honorable Cass Ballinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mine's much simpler. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We, we, we have been having hearings on this bill for six years, and I can remember when I first came here having uh, Mrs. Schroeder, uh, who introduced it at the beginning, um, speak as a witness, and I asked her as a witness, why was it, uh, why was, if, if it really was that important, why wasn't it to be paid leave? And she said, well, we, let's get this first, and we'll go out paid leave next. <laughs> and so my amendment uh, offers the opportunity, I think, to, uh, to do voluntarily, which I think she would like to have in, in the long run. And, and my, my amendment would add an additional category in the, def, in the definition section of the bill. It would exempt from H.R. 1 employees who are entitled to at least six weeks of paid leave, and the employees would be entitled to the same leave requirements, job reinstatement, and benefit protections currently offered in H.R. 1. Enforcement of these provisions would be on a contractual basis in state courts, and this is not uh, an exceptional new thing because uh, OSHA at the present time has uh, a voluntary protection program which 
uh, businesses that want to do take the extra mile or do the extra step are allowed to and, and exempt themselves from uh, standard OSHA inspections. Um, obviously, this amendment provides an incentive for employers to provide paid leave and benefits to those employees who cannot afford to take the 12 weeks off with pay. And I think this is one of the major faults in the bill and the fact that uh, the majority of people will not be able to take this 12 weeks because they just can't afford it. So to my way of thinking, this amendment is sensible and fair and uh, thank you for listening to my concerns. I, a lot of people might question the idea that business would be willing to pay this additional cost uh, to give six weeks of, uh, of pay. But uh, having been in the business world and, and, and seen the way people feel about government regulations, I would say that they'd be very happy to add a benefit to probably keep the government from in interfering with the operation of their companies. And that's what the purpose of this uh, amendment is. Thank you. Mr. Quella? No questions, but as always, Cash, you do a fine job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Porter? Cass, I think your experience uh, shines through on this. I think it's a good idea, and I wish we could proceed with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, sir. The Honorable Peter Hoxter. Is that the right pronunciation? I was, didn't know whether it was within my purview to correct that or not. It's sure. Mr. Hookstra. Hook. Ho Hookstra. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, it's good to be here. Uh, what I'm proposing today is I don't have six years of background on the hearings. Uh, of course, we had the, uh, the two sessions uh, last week where we discussed uh, this bill. Really what I'm proposing is a technical amendment. Uh, in the original bill that I was reviewing, uh, the Labor Department was given two months to write the rules and regulations, after which businesses were then given four additional months uh, to implement it so that businesses would have six months from the date of enactment of the bill to when they would actually have to implement the program. The changes that were made uh, the last day of committee hearings uh, identified that the Labor Department would have four months to develop the rules and regulations by which the business community would have to implement this uh, this bill. All I'm asking for is that the extension be made to eight months uh, before businesses actually have to implement it so that the business community will have the same length of time to implement the bill as what it will take the Department of Labor to write the rules and regulations uh, by which the bill should be implemented. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. No question, Mr. Chairman, but Peter, I, I know that these hearings meant a lot to you and you absorbed a lot of the foresight in the bill, but I certainly object to the program being federally mandated. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Thank okay. you very much. That's great. Thank you. The Honorable Bob Carr of Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement that I'll just submit for the record. Without objecting, the entire statement of Mr. Carr will appear on the record. Brief remarks. I guess my plea to this committee is that we have an open rule. Failing that, that it allow an amendment which I've uh, noticed to the committee in my prepared remarks. There are a number of people in this Congress who have a great deal of experience with uh, family medical leave because they were on a committee or they sat through a lot of hearings. A number of us have experience because we actually operated in the private sector. Uh, our experience tells us, some of us, that we ought to mandate that family medical leave be uh, granted to every working American, not just those in workplaces of uh, 50 or more. Uh, but our experience similarly tells us that while we ought to mandate that every worker in America have uh, family medical leave, that the exact formulation for what leave, under what circumstances, and under what business conditions ought to be worked out in the workplace. Uh, some of us believe that uh, family medical leave is very important, but that a one-size-fits-all from Washington, D.C. and the Congress of the United States and, it's, and the limitations under which we operate is, is not a wise course for our country. It affords too little protection in terms of its coverage on the one hand and potentially oppressive uh, and unworkable 
mandates on the part of uh, uh, the government to business uh, on the other. Uh, my proposal would be that uh, the Congress mandate, uh, the federal government mandate, that there be family medical leave, but that we establish a system of incentives to make sure that essentially there's collective bargaining even where there's no uh, union representation between the workers and the management of every workplace in America. We have some workplaces, as you know, Mr. Chairman, that are filled with uh, uh, a lot of older people. We have some workplaces filled <coughs> with uh, a gender bias. Um, we have some uh, workplaces that are uh, heavy, heavy in seasonal uh, activity. We have some workplaces where we're laying off people because, like in Michigan and some places like uh, Massachusetts, uh, the businesses are in decline and they're having 10% fewer sales this year than last year and have had that for the last uh, 10 years. And we also know that there are some workplaces where they're adding people almost by the minute. We understand that something like <clears throat> mandating uh, um, child labor laws, mandating a healthy work environment uh, is important no matter what the workplace, where it is, whether it's uh, uh, growing or, or declining and, and whether uh, it's filled with older people, younger people, or, or has a gender bias. But the ability to give leave, uh, it seems to me, shouldn't be uh, the, the exact prescription for the leave mandated shouldn't be di dictated by Congress and it shouldn't be dictated by Washington, D.C. It really ought to be left to the, the people in the workplace. I, uh, I asked for the opportunity to offer an amendment, which I think would do that. And uh, beyond that, I, I hope that you'd uh, give us an open rule. Um, the last two times around, we've had uh, a modified open rule, a fairly uh, limiting uh, opportunity, and I understand uh, it was heavily invested in presidential politics and positioning uh, of, of uh, one branch vis-a-vis -vis the other. Um, I would submit to you we've got, a, we've got a new day here in Washington. We don't really need to do that. And we ought to have the faith and, and the uh, optimism of uh, democracy working its will on the House floor. So I would ask that there be an open room, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. <laughs> I have no questions, Bob. But uh, you've been very patient in waiting to testify. And I appreciate it. I'm very patient. Mr. Garth? I'll associate myself with Mr. Quillen's remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. The Honorable Robert Walker. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would hope that the committee would uh, offer uh, the House a chance to work its will on this legislation uh, through an open uh, amendment process, uh, through an open rule. Um, I have an amendment uh, which would be an entirely germane amendment to, to the bill uh, and one which I would plan to offer under an open rule. And if we do not have an open rule, I hope it is one that the committee w would make an order. This amendment largely goes to a technical question, but it's one that I think uh, should be resolved. Uh, under the provisions of the bill, um, when we deal with uh, a family leave, the term spouse is left undefined. That becomes fairly important in a bill that is designed largely to be a trial lawyer's bill. This is a bill meant to encourage a large number of suits against businesses across the country. Specifically turned down in the committee was the idea that the bureaucrats uh, were going to actually monitor this program. Rather, it is included in the bill that the idea here is that the enforcement power will be in the hands of the trial lawyers. Uh, and so therefore, um, uh, we are going to have a series of suits uh, of businesses based upon the provisions of this act. Anything left undefined is likely to be uh, a matter of a suit against an employer. Whether or not it, in, it helps the employees, and most employees are not going to be able to take 12 weeks off the job, uh, the fact is that uh, it will be a way uh, to uh, garner uh, a lot of, um, of changes in, in the law. 
In this particular instance, there is a uh, there is a very large problem because it does give the trial lawyers an ability to argue, for instance, uh, that a couple living together is a spousal relationship, uh, and so therefore uh, anyone asking uh, to uh, get off work for, uh, because of a live-in partner's illness could in fact be included under this bill. It raises questions about um, uh, where in uh, the pattern of various states and common law marriages uh, wh when uh, someone should be allowed uh, to, um, uh, to claim uh, this particular benefit. All my amendment would do is allow us to uh, consider the subject and say that a spouse is someone who is a husband or wife determined under state law. Uh, so that uh, we would have a clear definition of this and so businessmen would not be left hanging uh, and uh, would know uh, who it is that is permitted to take uh, this leave and who is not permitted to take the leave. And I would certainly hope that an amendment which is largely technical in nature but I think addresses a very important subject would be allowed to, to be uh, offered. This would go in the definition section of the bill uh, and would simply uh, define more clearly uh, what some of these um, uh, matters uh, really should be. So you'd allow the st states to make the determination? Well, the process. states the states already have laws in most cases as to, as to for instance, when a common law living arrangement becomes uh, a, a specific legal tie. Uh, those, are, those laws are already in place, uh, and this would simply affirm that that is the, the pattern uh, uh, that should be used for um, uh, per the provisions of this bill. Mr. Quilla? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bob, as always, you do a good job. I appreciate your remarks, although I'm opposed to the measure. I think your amendment would improve the bill. I thank you. Mr. Goss. I uh, want to make sure I understand you, uh, Mr. Walker, that uh, basically you feel that the state's determination on defining spouse is, is an adequate way to proceed, but for clarity and to remove any uh, indecision or any possible uh, uh, creative uh, uh, arguments in the courtroom, you would like to have it codified in this bill. It's my understanding that this bill largely preempts uh, state law in this area and would in fact uh, bring about um, uh, the ability to sue in federal court uh, over, over these matters. And in fact, we do leave the enforcement power up to the Trial Lawyers Association. Therefore, the definitions which are in the bill become the operative definitions. The term spouse is not defined, uh, and uh, all this particular measure would do is assure that that is a, uh, uh, a definition that exists within the bill and uh, uh, would not uh, open up uh, a, a whole new body of litigation on what constitutes a spouse for, for receiving of this mandated benefit. Well, Chairman Ford and Chairman Clay said that they just didn't make any further definition of spouse because the state laws would apply, whatever state uh, would take it up. Well, then they shouldn't have any problem whatsoever with this amendment because that's all this amendment uh, really says is, is assures that. But that is not clear in the law. The fact is that they define many things in the bill. But they, they left this one entirely uh, undefined. And there are already uh, a number of activist groups uh, who have indicated that because of the lack of definition, uh, that they are going to be able to take this matter to court. Uh, and um, I think it becomes incumbent upon us to, to nail it down. That's all my amendment would do. And um, uh, I think uh, it would uh, make sense uh, uh, for the committee to permit that kind of definition to take place if, in fact, uh, the committee chairman is saying that, um, uh, that that's their intent anyway. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Bob, uh, the uh, chairman, the two chairmen of the committees, and uh, I had, had a colloquy on uh, this amendment uh, earlier. Uh, all your amendment says is, quote, the term spouse means a husband or wife under the law of any state. Uh, that certainly does uh, uh, resolve the problem of having the word spouse uh, not uh, uh, talked to in, in, the, in the bill. but. Uh, uh, they were adamant about uh, making the amendment in order. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's one of the most important reasons. I happen to have voted for this bill last year, and uh, this makes it very difficult for uh, me and others to support the legislation. So uh, I hope that we can make your amendment in order. But uh, 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 if, if I might, they were adamant that they would, not, they would not want this amendment to be offered on the floor? Yes. Well, for, for, for what conceivable reason, if, if what they say is that this amendment follows uh, precisely their intent? 
Well, again, they did not want the bill, the amendment dealt with on the floor. It's obvious that it's a, it's a controversial issue in their minds. I think, uh, I think the amendment would be overwhelmingly supported uh, by the American people. And certainly uh, under an open rule process, we would be allowed that opportunity. Well, I might say, Mr. Chairman, that makes it even clearer to me that this amendment is needed. Because if, if what we're doing is consciously leaving that term uh, undefined, and if, in fact, what is happening here is that you, that you have that the committee chairman basically saying that they will accept no amendment to further clarify the matter, then it seems to me that, uh, that the trial lawyers may have already gotten their uh, hooks into this thing and, and may have their suits already prepared uh, and um, uh, that uh, we ought to nail this thing down uh, before it becomes a monster. Their, their definite, their argument was that it, it, it's already defined in state law, so this would be redundant. It is my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that, that much of what we're doing here preempts state laws which are, which are already in place. And so the question is whether or not if you sue in federal court, whether or not anybody, uh, anybody's um, uh, uh, state laws would apply to, to a suit uh, within federal court. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, think, I think that, that, that clearly... Uh, that, uh, that, that it could be argued that, uh, that because of the lack of definition, uh, the Congress meant to leave this as an open issue. Well, they, they, it's my opinion that, I'm sorry, uh, yes, my opinion yes. that uh, they wrote this as a minimum proviso and the, the states can expand it in any way they want. Well, sure, the states can expand beyond this, but, it, but where it's a minimum requirement, and, and the fact is that, 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 the, that the actions with regard to who is eligible can be brought to a federal court. State law does not define to, to, uh, the, the matters for federal court. The only thing we will have is legislative history created before this committee if we can't debate the matter on the floor. Uh, and um, uh, therefore, in federal court, I can't see how any state's definition would apply because there, there are 50 different definitions probably of this matter. And so the only way that we can nail it down is, is to say that the states are in fact the governing authority here so that if someone brings a matter into federal court, we know that it, it is the, the state laws that should apply. Well, the truth of the matter is, Bob, that um, any time that the United States Congress enacts a law that creates a, a uh, program or creates a mandate on states or local government or the private sector, uh, it certainly should lay down uh, guidelines. Now, when it comes to Social Security, uh, a, a surviving spouse cannot leave uh, uh, those benefits to a roommate. It has to be to a husband or wife. When it comes to federal retirement benefits, whether you be a member of Congress or whether you be a federal employee under civil service, you cannot leave your benefits to a roommate or to a friend. It has to be left to a legal spouse, man or wife. And we ought to be doing the same thing with this. This amendment ought to be made in order so that we can debate it on the floor of Congress. Well, I think I'm right that those particular regulations are specified under federal law, and we don't rely on, on, on the state law to define who a spouse is for purposes of, of Social Security benefits. We, we, we say specifically under, under uh, federal law what uh, uh, that particular relationship has to be. The gentleman is correct. The gentleman yield. Uh, yes, I uh, you got me friend. a little confused at the moment. I'd like to ask a question. Suppose you have a corporation that is involved in multi-state business and their general corporate policy is taken to court. Under your proposed amendment, which codifies the state law, which state law would apply uh, to a company? Would it be the, the law where the company is corporate headquartered? Would it be the area of infraction where the suit is, is brought? Uh, what would be the measure? I think generally under federal law it's where the company is headquartered uh, and uh, you know that that is applied to cases uh, across across the board where, where that is uh, 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 where it becomes a matter of, of general policy. I must tell you that I am more I am more concerned in this case about small business people you know that the 50 and 60 business uh, person most of the big corporations are going to be able to have their lawyers nail this thing down pretty tightly the fact is it's the guy who employs uh, 52 employees uh, that may not have everything nailed down exactly tight and is going to be the subject of the trial lawyer who decides to get his name in the headlines and make himself some money uh, with this kind of suit. And this, th this will assure uh, that he will at least have to reference the state laws uh, in terms of, sp uh, of spouse before uh, he can bring such a suit into court. Well, I agree with the gentleman's purpose, but if we're going to clarify it, let's clarify the whole thing. And, I, and now I, your, your comments have raised this question about multi-state, but I'd be guided by attorneys on that. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
The Honorable Timothy Penny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I've devoted a lot of uh, time and attention to the uh, issue of family and medical leave over the last several years. Uh, uh, my involvement began as a temporary member of the Education and Labor Committee some years back um, and extended uh, uh, into uh, the, the most recent legislative session in which uh, I worked uh, behind the scenes to try and craft a compromise proposal uh, that would have reduced uh, somewhat the number of uh, weeks that we allow for leave for purposes other than birth and adoption. In the final analysis, that uh, compromise uh, proposal was not brought to a vote, um, but uh, given the fact that we're now putting this issue on a fast track, I felt important to at least file with uh, your committee uh, three amendments, uh, uh, one in the nature of a substitute, which would uh, essentially um, request a vote on a proposal which I uh, introduced in the last session to uh, limit the, the, uh, the leave uh, to birth and adoption only. The second, uh, in the nature of a limiting amendment uh, so that uh, the number of weeks available uh, for uh, uh, leave other than birth and adoption would be uh, six weeks, uh, so a lesser amount of leave for those purposes. And the third amendment is, is uh, essentially clarifying in nature uh, and would address uh, a problem that may uh, uh, result for uh, uh, business firms uh, who offer unpaid leave to salaried personnel uh, and we don't want to see uh, those uh, personnel redefined as waged employees uh, due to that decision to provide unpaid leave um, but in the absence of this amendment that uh, in fact could occur and if they are redefined as waged employees we could have an, a whole new category of workers who will fall under the uh, requirements of a, a whole range of other labor laws and um, I, don't, I don't think it's the intent uh, in passing this bill to create uh, that new uh, classification of uh, uh, workers and for that reason uh, uh, I filed that third amendment as, uh, as what I believe uh, a technical change in this bill to uh, prevent a problem uh, from cropping up in, in the years ahead. Um, and I would simply ask the committee to uh, act favorably on my request uh, to uh, make in order either of the first uh, two uh, amendments, one is a substitute, the other is a limiting amendment. Um, and regardless how you might uh, decide on, on those two issues, uh, I think the last amendment, since it is uh, largely technical in nature, uh, absolutely ought to be made in order and uh, would ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you. Solomon. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Tim, let me uh, say that three of your amendments are germane, and, the, uh, and one of the three does require a, uh, a germaneness waiver because you uh, amend the Fair Labor Standards Act. But uh, let me just say to you that there were only 30 amendments pre-filed. Uh, we only have two bills on the floor this week. Uh, this bill on Wednesday and the motor voter on Thursday. Uh, there will probably be a total of about five hours of debate on the two bills. Uh, certainly uh, with no rush of, uh, of traffic of, of trying to get legislation to the floor, we ought to have an open rule to allow all of these germane amendments to be debated on the floor. Uh, even limited to 20 minutes per amendment. Uh, at least uh, people like yourself would have a chance to be heard. And uh, I would hope that we could make, uh, make all three of your amendments in order. Mr. Petri has a similar amendment to yours. He said that he would uh, uh, had no pride of authorship. He would certainly support yours. So uh, we would push to try to get your amendment made in order. Well, Mr. Chairman, especially at this uh, time uh, during the session, it, it does uh, seem to me that we, we have time to uh, debate issues uh, more fully. Um, this is an issue that is not new to us, uh, but uh, uh, especially as it pertains to floor uh, activity, we've never really allowed for a more open process of debate on this issue. Uh, for some reason, we're evidently afraid to allow other options or uh, amendments to, to be presented, um, and, uh, and I just uh, believe that that runs counter to our essential democratic principles. I mean, we've got to let the majority rule around here. Some of these amendments have merit. If they go down, they go down. Um, but um, simply asking for consideration of these amendments and a fair fight on the floor. Thanks, Tim. Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I had a question, actually, uh, about uh, the uh, number one amendment that is of the three you produced. It's the relationship between the definition uh, and the description I have of your amendment uh, that defines a serious health condition under Wisconsin law. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if there is a relationship between a serious health condition and the time somebody would need, an employee would need to cope. Uh, 
the difference between a six-week period or a 12-week period. I, I, th I like your amendment. I like what you're suggesting. And I certainly uh, think that your remarks uh, make a great deal of sense. What I don't know is, has anybody done any studies? Uh, and I don't, I'm a fam not familiar with the, with the Wisconsin definition. Yeah. Well, first of all, we, we only have, I think, 13 states in the nation that have a family medical leave law. And, and some of them uh, restrict that only to birth and adoption. So this whole notion of providing a, a guaranteed uh, leave of, uh, of, of any sort um, uh, beyond birth and adoption is something that's relatively new and, and untested. Uh, and, and for those reasons, I really feel that under federal law, if we're going to mandate this across the country, we ought to start out modestly uh, and see what the experience is. Uh, I think six weeks is more than enough time to reserve for uh, individuals to uh, devote to some family health crisis. Um, we're not mandating they take the entire six weeks. We're just uh, suggesting that uh, they ought to have some time uh, uh, up to six weeks uh, each year that they can use for those purposes. Uh, I think it would be more than enough uh, in all but the most extreme cases. Um, but I do also believe that we could run into some uh, difficulties if we don't better uh, define the, the uh, uh, term serious health condition. Uh, under Wisconsin law, that is defined as a disabling condition. And, uh, and that's more tightly drawn than this bill. I don't think we want the Department of Labor making these judgments through regulations uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, they might develop. I don't think the expertise lies there, but in Wisconsin, by, by determining this as a disabling condition, they've largely limited the application to those uh, circumstances that, that make you homebound, if not bedbound. And, um, and I think that that's a, a much tighter uh, way of uh, uh, defining the, the issue than we have under the bill. And, um, and, uh, and I think that that could help pre prevent some uh, problems in terms of applying this law. Well, just by way of illustration, would that include, say, a bad case of the flu? I, I've been in bed for 10 days with yeah. a bad case of the flu. I think it was life-threatening, and I was sure bed-bound. Now, yeah. does that qualify? I don't, I don't know that uh, the Wisconsin law is tighter than the federal law. I don't know for sure whether that would, uh, would, that, whether that would be covered. Um, okay. It's a disabling condition uh, of a semi, uh, of, of a, uh, it, I, I think in the Wisconsin law, it sort of follows the, uh, uh, the approach that we've taken uh, with, uh, uh, with Social Security uh, disability, where if it's uh, a partial disability that's, that's permanent or a permanent disability that, that is, uh, that is um, um, of an intermittent, it's permanent, permanent disability for a restricted period of time, in other words, it's totally disabling for a certain period of time, uh, then I think that that would, uh, that would fit the Wisconsin definition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. The Honorable James Traficant. The Honorable Michael Bilarakis. The Honorable Bill Houghton of Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the committee uh, would, I would like to invite Representative Dunn to join me in a panel since we're both talking about the same amendment. Fine. <coughs> Chair recognizes Representative Dunn. Also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I might mention to you that um, uh, Fred Grandy from Iowa is also an original uh, author and sponsor of uh, this amendment in the form of a substitute. Uh, he will be testifying to you. He's uh, inadvertently tied up at the moment, uh, and our schedules uh, require that we move on. So uh, we'll briefly outline uh, to you and hope that you would consider uh, Mr. Grandy as, uh, as he's able to uh, testify to you. We appreciate the opportunity of coming before Rules Committee and asking you to uh, make in order uh, our amendment in the form of a substitute. Uh, we recognize uh, there is a germaneness issue and would require a germaneness waiver uh, for this substitute since it does change tax code uh, and would be required uh, initially to go through ways and means. <clears throat> but um, I think the point is that uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act uh, indeed has a very laudable goal, which I think most in this body share. And that is that people not lose their job as a result of sickness or family emergency. The real question is, how do you get there from here? And as, uh, as we have looked at uh, the bill before us, um, it makes a great statement. 
but in my opinion will have relatively little positive impact in my district and let me share for you why in my district ninety five percent of the workforce works for small business with fifty or fewer employees they're exempted of the five percent that would be covered under this bill the top ten percent paid workforce is also exempted under the bill uh, of the five percent who would be covered under this bill a large percentage of those working for employers with over 50 employees are already covered under collective bargaining agreements and therefore this bill is not needed and would have uh, would have no impact on them of those who are not covered under collective bargaining agreements uh, the larger businesses in my district uh, such as word perfect and novell already have negotiated voluntary benefit plans with the employees that provide very liberal uh, uh, leave programs um, and so it gets down to one or two percent of the workforce in my district who would even be impacted by this bill and as you look at that one or two percent they are mostly the lower income individuals who cannot afford to take 12 weeks leave without pay from work. And so what we're attempting to do in this substitute is to provide a reasonable alternative, an alternative which uses current existing statutory schemes such as Section 125, uh, cafeteria plans, uh, simplified employee pension plans, the existing statute we have to provide an incentive mechanism to bring employer, employee, and the government together to provide for funded leave programs. These funded leave programs, and the easiest way to think of it would be as a portable IRA plan or a, a single purpose or special use IRA plan. Such a plan would allow the employer and employee to contribute together into the plan. It would be portable, so as the employee, employee moved from one employer to another, uh, their benefit would follow. It would also be convertible, so if the employee does not need those funded benefits uh, during their career, it would be convertible into the IRA plan, which provides uh, for greater retirement benefits at the end. Uh, this plan is a, a well thought out plan which I believe uh, goes hand in hand with President Clinton's uh, stated objectives of putting people first. We, as we consider now and uh, over the next few months an economic stimulus package, we need to realize that business needs to not only invest in property, plant, and equipment, but must invest in human capital as well. This is a way that we can solve, really solve the problem. Uh, and provide for meaningful benefits under market forces in a way that uh, is proven to, uh, to be currently working in the system. So I would encourage uh, uh, the committee to consider uh, uh, making our amendment in order and uh, having an open rule on this bill. Ms. Stern. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Congressman Solomon, for letting me testify today. And I'm glad to be on the same platform with a member of the loyal or, or of the opposition. And uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Grandy is not here to uh, testify now because he's worked very hard on this. Um, uh, what we think is a is a good practical solution to a problem that we all admit exists. Um, Mr. Orton's voiced his opposition based on his analysis that HR1 does not provide truly attainable benefits for low and middle income individuals who will be without pay for 12 weeks. While I pl applaud the uh, interest of the Clinton administration in promoting the welfare of our nation's families, I'm very disappointed that the first measure that will evidently have the president's <coughs> signature is another mandated and unfunded federal mandate. The measure that we're bringing before you today offers a funded alternative to provide real and attainable benefits to every American family. Today, I pledge to work diligently with Republicans and Democrats in the search for hope and opportunities for our families, but a closer review of H.R. 1 shows that this bill will serve to the detriment of the economy, of small business, and more importantly, to women and families. Mr. Chairman, I think we all know that in our society, when a child is born or a loved one is ill, it is the woman who will most likely bear the burden of caring for that infant or for that sick or aging parent. This bill is titled the Family and Medical Leave Act. 
but the great and disproportionate impact will fall on the shoulders of the women of America. Mr. Chairman, by the year 2000, 51% of the workers in small businesses will be women. And currently, 65% of all American women in their childbearing years are in the labor force. Given these statistics, it's apparent that we must reflect on how business, and especially small business, will react toward a prospective young female employee, given that this unfunded federal mandate adds significantly to the cost of her employment. Uh, we place these young women uh, in a very subtle trap where they are pitted against older women and against male counterparts. Mr. Chairman, our proposal offered here for consideration by the Rules Committee provides a funded alternative that enhances the status of women in our economy, and particularly in the small business community. This alternative provides viable, attainable, and paid benefits that will cover more women, men, and ultimately benefit more children. Through tax incentives, it offers to small businesses the opportunity to empower their employees with a family leave package that is flexible and tailored to the specific needs of the employee. To my colleagues on the Rules Committee, I urge you and implore you to allow the full membership of the House to have the opportunity to cast their judgment on a funded, flexible uh, alternative that offers true hope to the women and the families of the United States. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Let me uh, welcome both of you to the, uh, the Rules Committee. Bill, you first. Uh, you're one of the most thoughtful members on your side of the aisle, we think, on our side of the aisle anyway. And uh, certainly the, the amendments you bring to us today uh, proves that. Uh, and Jennifer, you're a new freshman member. Uh, we, this is the first time before the Rules Committee, and we welcome you here. Might also point out that um, uh, you've just been appointed as a member of the Joint Committee uh, to reform this Congress. And this bill before us today is a perfect example of why this Congress needs reforming. You know, Bill, your, uh, your approach uh, by using the U.S. tax code is, uh, is really points to what government can do. Now, as far as the economy is concerned, you know, we in government can, we can control interest rates and that can help the economy. Uh, we can uh, uh, give regulatory relief uh, from, from mandates on the private sector. That helps the economy. Or we can adjust the U.S. tax code, which is what we've been trying to do now for several years. Uh, through tax incentives to business and industry. Really, that's what, what you're doing here. Unfortunately, the rules of this House are going to prevent us from being able to consider, most likely, your amendment, because your amendment does uh, require adjusting the U.S. tax code. Mr. Rostenkowski is opposed to it. Uh, therefore, we won't have the opportunity to go to the floor and debate this issue, the issue of whether or not to give tax credits to the private sector or to uh, levy some mandate on the private sector. That ought to be what we're, it's what we're here for, to debate these issues. We're going to be prevented. So Jennifer, I wish you a lot of luck. I'm on that committee with you. Uh, it's a long, tough haul, but uh, hopefully we might be able to come up with something that's going to resolve this kind of a problem. I hope we can make your amendment in order, and um, I support it very strongly. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I might just add to that that uh, uh, in the event this uh, amendment in the order of, or in the nature of a substitute is not in order uh, on this discussion, I certainly hope and would encourage that it uh, be made in order as we consider economic stimulus packages. And we will be working with the White House to encourage this and other forms of incentives for investing in human capital be included in the stimulus package that we will be looking at over the next few months. So we will have an opportunity to look at the Internal Revenue Code. As a tax attorney in private practice, I spent years uh, sitting down with business leaders. Uh, I know the impact and the effectiveness of targeted tax incentives. They can have a very real and a very legitimate uh, uh, impact on achieving a broader social purpose and do so through voluntary and market forces. 
And uh, that's what we would encourage the opportunity to debate during the discussion of family leave. Uh, if not during this discussion, certainly as we look at uh, a stimulus package, uh, we have to realize that part of our problem is not just that capital uh, has flown from American business in property, plant, and equipment, but we have paid little attention to our human capital and our workforce in training in providing the, the needed benefits uh, and opportunities. And that, I think, must be a part of a, a stimulus package. Well, let me just say that I hope uh, uh, we're going to fight very hard to make your amendment in order, uh, because it is a bipartisan amendment. It deserves time on the floor. But uh, failing that, if it is not made in order, we'll have three hours and 20 minutes of debate. Uh, if you would come to the floor and make that exact statement, it would go a long way towards, I think, uh, enlightening this Congress about what the needs of this country are today. Thank you. And I think further, I and thank you for your kind remarks, uh, Mr. Solomon, uh, this, this type of approach to solving problems uh, whose goal we all agree on, uh, but solving them through private sector market forces, through incentive programs rather than mandates, I think it provides our new president a wonderful opportunity for bipartisan support. There are many of us demonstrated today and in and many other situations from now on who do want to work together. I mean, we agree what the uh, solution, uh, we agree what the goal needs to be, but it's the solution that we differ on. And I certainly agree with Congressman Orton and am privileged to be speaking with him today that we should take a second look at this one. We think we've got a better answer and to allow the public and the Congress to debate this one I think will work very much to President Clinton's uh, best interests. Mr. Garth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also would like to congratulate you both for coming forward and uh, expounding in such a uh, clear manner uh, what I think is a, another good solution to a problem we're all trying to uh, resolve. My problem is this. Uh, the last time we addressed an approach like this, we were in, quote, dreaded gridlock, and it was the 102nd Congress. Well, now we're out of dreaded gridlock. Now we're into whatever comes after dreaded gridlock and I don't think our oppor I don't think our opportunities are, are going to be any better because I think you will go back to ideographics and probably would have to use carbon uh, testing to get the dates of when these ideas were originally proposed and have still not been heard uh, but I congratulate you for trying uh, and everything we can possibly do to support that effort which I think is totally legitimate and most beneficial to the process if not the outcome uh, is worth doing, and we'll do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Gus. very much. This is a, a, a new day, and I think uh, it is an opportunity to try again uh, to bring forth uh, into the light uh, a real debate and discussion of these issues. And so I thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. The Honorable Amo Houghton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Amo. Thank you, gentlemen. Good to be with you today. Uh, I feel a little bit like this is uh, three strikes and you're out, because what I'm about to say <laughs> is not particularly new. You've heard me before, and you probably could I know, recite but you, it. But you sound so I know, great, I always look I do, forward to seeing you. I know, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, I just have to take a minute or two to emphasize something which I think is important here. Uh, many times we get tangled up on our scabbard with a great idea and a sort of a messy process of implementing that idea. And I think that's where I'm coming from. I happen to think uh, uh, this is not the greatest bill in the world. I don't think this is any secret uh, to you and to others. <laughs> Uh, but if we are going to have something, we ought to have something which is livable. And I will tell you why this particular bill is not livable and why I have put an amendment here. Uh, Martin, how are you? Uh, uh, why I've put an amendment to change uh, one section 101 from 1,250 hours to 1,500 hours and also make the... Uh, critical mass, 100 employees rather than 50 employees. Let me concentrate on that last issue for a moment. Uh, you know, if you're in business, and, uh, and let's say you've got a company of 60 people, uh, and you're making a widget, 
And let's say you've got 10 people on a shift. So that's 40 people out of the 60. And then you've got maintenance people, and then you've got electricians, you've got quality control people, and then you've got all your other staff people. I mean, every single person is a key employee. I mean, it isn't just the president or the accountant or the supervisorship. Everybody is important. And then to be able to say, if somebody goes out, you can have your job back or an equivalent job uh, if you go out for 12 weeks. You can do it in a larger company. As a matter of fact, the company that I used to work for not only did it, but did it with pay. And I think a lot of other companies our size did that. But the one-size-fit-all concept, I think, is not good. That's where the whole, the whole theory falls down. And frankly, I think that you need a sufficiently large company. If you accept the fact, and I barely do, that this thing ought to be mandated anyway, uh, to be able to have a company be able to absorb this. And I don't think you do with 50. As a matter of fact, I come from a business background which says the important thing is to serve your customer. And I don't know anybody who you are serving who wants this. The big companies don't need it. Uh, most of the unions uh, are representing companies which are far larger than this. 70 to 80 percent of the new jobs uh, come from the smaller businesses. Uh, so the, the people who you are trying to help don't want to be helped in this way. But if they are to be helped, they ought to be helped in a way where the company is significantly large enough to be able to absorb that business. God knows who established it, but that's what it is around here, is 100 people. So to move down to 50, and frankly, I can see this thing going back to what the original version was, to 35, and all those are killers. Now, I've told you this story before, and, and it's a little repetitive. But you know, there's a wonderful guy that started a business up where I live. And he said, you know, this whole concept of family leave, I really don't understand what it is, but I, I think I understand what the kernel is. And I want to have it someday. I can't do it now. I can't afford it. But I'm going to do it someday. But you know something? I'm going to have a health insurance care first. And frankly, because of our younger employees, I'm going to have a child care uh, system first before that. But I'll do it. But you know, when I do it, I want to take credit for it. I don't want a bunch of people who've never been in business down there taking credit for it. And I hope that you'll support me on this. And so I'm not only talking from my own experience and my own memory dump, but I'm also talking from those people, and I can multiply that story many times, who feel the same way. So now, the, uh, the, the <laughs> asking for the order, uh, it's I would like to be able to propose this amendment and have it discussed on the floor, period. Paragraph, end of story. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just have, um, have, uh, which company uh, were you with? And I was with a company called Corning. Corning. It used to be Corning Glassworks, but yes. now it's Corning. And were you the CEO of that yes. company? Yes. Okay. How many employees did it have when you were with them? Well, it had between uh, 30 and 40,000 people varying on the you know types of businesses it was in. Mm -hmm. So you, you were with a very large business, I was a large, with successful a, business. Yeah, I mean, it's not like General Motors or something like that. Yeah, that's but a pretty good sized business. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I came in, of course, uh, during your testimony, and I'm sorry that I didn't hear all sure. of it. Uh, did you say that your company had some policy like this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think we had, uh, I think this goes back into the late 60s. Mm -hmm. We not only have a family leave program, but we have a paid family leave program. Mm -hmm. It involves a many more features than involved here, but we could afford it. But the difference uh, with us and the small ones, and, and granted, you've got to recognize that, that our company was the largest company of its size in the smallest town, uh, because Corning has only have, have uh, 12,500 people in it. I mean, most larger companies, you know, the larger communities. And so we were very aware of the difference, and sometimes it was a real handicap for other people starting businesses and not having this program. But they ultimately did it on their own. And as you know, 93% of all these small businesses have it anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, just one other question. Where would you draw the line then in terms of number 100. of employees? 100. 100 employees. It's not ideal. Uh, I wish you weren't coming up anyway. But if it is, I think 100 is at least manageable. Okay. I, I have no other questions, Mr. Thank Solomon. you. <coughs> Labo, uh, you know, you raise such a uh, such a valid point. What this amounts to is that uh, the members of the uh, Education and Labor Committee 
which are less than 10% of the House of Representatives, are going to dictate to the other 90% and to the entire country. Uh, because we probably are not going to be able to uh, have the votes to make your amendment in order. Now, there are certain portions of this uh, family medical leave bill which are very controversial. Now, you're one that would like to support the bill uh, if it would affect only those businesses with 100 employees or over. Uh, that is a, a, a very valid point to debate on the floor of Congress. It would not take 20 minutes for you to present your side and to have the managers of the bill uh, present theirs. And yet, we aren't going to be able to make that amendment in order. We're not going to be able to make uh, Mr. Grandy and Mr. Wharton's amendment in order, uh, which would talk about dealing with a tax incentive as opposed to a mandate. Now, that would not take an hour's debate. And yet, we have no business on the floor of Congress. We are here, sure, members of Congress are keeping busy at whatever we do, but we aren't doing the people's business on the floor of this House. We will spend less than six hours this week. We spent less than two hours last week, and we will spend less than uh, four hours the following week coming. Now, uh, there is no reason why we can't make your amendment in order, which simply raises exemption from 50 to 100. I think you also raised the uh, number of hours worked from 1,250 to 1,500, 1500, something like that. I mean, those are significant uh, ideas that need to be debated on the floor. I just hope we can make your amendment in, in order so that we can debate this issue. Well, if I could just respond to this, I do too. And uh, that, of course, that's a procedural issue. Uh, I don't know whether the amendment will go through. I guess the thing that I'm pleading uh, is, is if my amendment, maybe more than you're able to, to handle, uh, if my amendment is not involved, to not to do anything on this bill. Uh, I, I really, I really think that if you're going to do something for somebody to help them, they ought to want it. And the people you're doing something for don't want it. It's that simple. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Amo, I was sorry I wasn't able to be here for all of it. But let me say that you've uh, made a, a very compelling point on the issue itself. When you referred to the fact that there's uh, someone with a business who would like to be able to take a little credit for offering this kind of family and medical leave program for their employees. And it reminded me of a, of a, a similar situation. I was talking with a, a, a small banker in Monrovia, California, and we were talking about the issue of, of uh, family and medical leave. And he said, I like the concept of being able to offer this program to someone who is a particularly good model employee rather than the concept of having it standardized and in fact dictated by you guys back there in Washington. And uh, I think that that is something that we need to realize here. Again, we're making these business decisions because they are in fact that. And you uh, underscored something that I said earlier, the fact that 93% of the businesses today offer it. now. Uh, Mr. Clay, who was here earlier, disputed that. Where did you get that 93% figure? It was given to me by my staff uh, the, here. The uh, Small Business Federation here in town. Yeah, the, was that the NFIB, the yeah. National Federation of Independent Business? Right. Well, it does seem to me that, that we must recognize that. And I think that this concept of allowing people to have some sort of choice there is really the route for us to take. So I congratulate you for amendment. and. And you can count on me to vote uh, here in this committee to ensure that you have the right to offer it on the floor. Thank you. Could I just make sure, a comment Emma. on this? You know, it's as if it, it's as if this bill were not family leave. It was uh, it was a dental bill, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and the small companies might say, you know, that's a great idea, but I've got to get a general medical bill first. I've got to get something which affects some of our older employees. I'd like to put some of that money into increasing the pension to those people who have done They can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So to superimpose that at all, and then upon a small unit that can't absorb it, and particularly thinking about the fact that what we're trying to do is to encourage business, not suppress it, not overregulate it, I just think the whole concept is wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Ben Amo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quillen? No questions. Mr. Goss. Uh, Mr. Houghton, I want to make sure I heard you properly. You said that your, your company 
uh, does have a uh, family leave policy and yes. it's been in effect for some 30 years or so. Did the government mandate that your company do Absolutely that? Absolutely not. And you say that you have um, that you have a paid family leave in your company. Uh, how much taxpayers' money is actually involved in that? Well, none. Uh, obviously, uh, that you could uh, you could uh, <laughs> if this if the if the if the, uh, uh, if the if the plan had gone in and that went into income and the income was taxed, maybe that would go to towards general benefits, but directly, absolutely none. What your, what your testimony has been then is that your company, uh, without any government participation whatsoever, has actually come up with a very employee-sensitive benefit program that works extremely well without any negative impact to the taxpayers. Is that yes, a fair statement? Yes, if I could just elaborate on, on this. You know, uh, business is a social system. Uh, you know, the end result obviously has to be the generation of money to be able to keep it going in whatever form it is. Uh, and one of the things that, that we've been so proud of in our company is that we've been really pioneers in all the benefits that you can think of. That we were the first in this and the first in that and the first in that. Somebody didn't tell us to do it. We did it. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the source of great pride to us. Uh, it's not that, that, it, that it, uh, it solves all the problems, but that concept of, boy, you know, we're working for a company that really is thinking about it. It wasn't mandated. They did it on their own. Well, I think it's, that's a lot of what America is about, frankly, and I, I happen to feel this legislation, while it is well-intentioned, uh, has a very bad mechanic in it that is going to cause us some difficulty and confound the purpose of our good intention. I have one other question. Um, I happen to uh, work in a small company. And what happens in small companies, in my experience, is when you run out of profitability uh, because of mandates or bad business or a better product or competition from some other way, uh, you find out you're out of business. And when you're out of business, not only is management out of business, but everybody's out of business and people uh, don't have jobs. Your former employees don't have jobs. When that happens, and we all know it does regrettably, what rights do the former employees have uh, where do they go when the business is no longer able to operate because of mandates that have been imposed on it or other legitimate reasons? Do the employees have rights in those cases? Some do, some don't. Most don't. <coughs> Thank you very much. And just so the record is clear, uh, Mr. Alton, uh, this is your former company. It's not your current. You're no, not. No, you're no. not currently no, associated I, I, with I the company. I only have one job. Yes, and that's uh, I, and uh, how long have you? How long has it been since you've occupied the position of CEO at the company? Uh, 1983. Uh, okay. I was when the you CEO for 19 years. Yes, and uh, I, be I believe you are the the member of Congress who has headed the largest company in the entire Congress of so current members. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't counted up. Uh, I, 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 I suspect, I suspect of the members of Congress that you yeah. were the one who was the CEO of the largest enterprise before you arrived here. I'd like to point out he was also a former Marine. That's what also makes him a good member of Congress. Right. Thank and a, a non-commissioned officer, right? <laughs> right thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Years old. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, the, the Honorable Fred Grandy is the next witness. And Thank I don't you, know, is there anyone else appearing with you? I'm no, afraid. Mr. Chairman, I was supposed to appear with uh, Mr. Orton and Ms. Dunn, but uh, I apologize to the committee. I That's was right. downstairs introducing a welfare reform uh, bill which tracks directly with what the President of the United States has asked for, and I have been so busy trying to help the President uh, succeed in his agenda, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, that I was unfortunately he, delayed. He has a lot of helpers these days. Well, I'm certainly one, and that's why I'm here today. And I want to go back to uh, what I'm sure my colleagues, Mr. Orton and Ms. Dunn, said uh, very, em I'm sure, very emphatically and, and articulately, is if the family leave debate ends with this bill, we will essentially, via government fiat, force low-income workers in this country to choose between employment security and economic security. And I want to I get into the details of this, Mr. Chairman, because I have over the last few years um, led the charge against this, this mandate, not because I'm opposed to family leave, but because I think the model is wrong. I think it provides exactly the wrong signals, not necessarily to the employers. There's clearly mixed signals there, but to the employees. And let me begin with 
a couple of uh, facts and figures. I would ask, in addition to submitting my full statement to, for the record, to include a couple of uh, pieces of information implied by the Employee Benefit Research Institute, uh, which I'd like to accompany my testimony. But let me just summarize. Without objection, your Thank entire you. statement is in the record. Three points I want to make. First of all, since 1960, the amount of employer-provide benefits as a portion of compensation has doubled from 8% to 16%, and that currently amounts to a total benefit uh, package per annum of $474 billion. Now, that's, that's quite a chunk of change, Mr. Chairman, but, Chairman, but what I want to point out is that the ratio of voluntary benefits to mandatory benefits is four to one. We only have eight benefits that we mandate. Social Security retirement, Medicare Part A, workman's comp, unemployment insurance, and others. Beyond that, you have vacation, paid lunch, severance pay, legal assistance, child care, and a plethora of benefits which employers have voluntarily added because it makes them more competitive. And I would merely argue, and one of the reasons that I appeared uh, with Mr. Orton as a co-sponsor of the Family and Medical Leave account, is we believe that if you give people an incentive, they will use it. If you give them a penalty, they will find a way to get around it. Now, the other point I want to make is that, unfortunately, the Family and Medical Leave Act, H.R. 1, I think is guilty of both a sin of omission and a sin of commission. And the sin of commission, I think, is to those employees who are below the median income of the United States, which, uh, according to 1990 data, was $29,943. 59% of the workers in the workplace are below that amount. So you have to ask yourself, what are they going to do with 12 weeks of unpaid leave? They might get a day, they might take maybe three or four days. But in terms of a real medical emergency or even a planned medical event, the real problem here is there is no wage replacement, employment security, yes, but no economic security, money, to help them sustain themselves over a protracted uh, absence from the workplace. That is missing in the Family and Medical Leave Act. It is included in the Family and Medical Leave accounts because we provide through the tax code an incentive for human capital, for workers to invest in their workplace and for employers and employees to contribute into a paid fund which will then provide wage replacement. Now, the sin of omission to me is to arbitrarily decide that employers with 50 or fewer employees are somehow exempted from this. And while I can understand Mr. Houghton's uh, arguments for lifting the threshold, I would argue we shouldn't have a threshold at all. It's punitive, it's arbitrary, and it also discriminates against that employee who is going to be a low-wage earner. And Mr. Chairman, we know from the health care debate that almost is invariably somebody who works for an employer with 50 people or less. They're out of the mix. You cannot go to a woman who was working for a small glass maker in Corning, New York, if there is another one up there besides Corning, who has maybe 35 employees and say, good news, you've got family and medical leave because they don't. But a tax incentive provided to the employer and the employee to put money into an instrument that could either be used for leave or a tax deferred IRA is something they can really use. And right now, they don't have it. Now, let me just track along with something that the President has said in which I concur with wholeheartedly. In his Putting People First campaign book, he said, virtually every industrialized nation recognizes the importance of strong families in its tax code. We should too. Amen. We should. And where this benefit belongs is in the tax code. This is not labor law. It is not, it is not properly couched as a federal mandate. It is something that should be benefit policy generated through the tax code. And I might, I might say, anticipating one of the things that will be argued tomorrow on the floor. You will always hear whenever we argue f about mandated leave that we are the only nation in the industrialized wor world, the only last remaining democracy that doesn't do this. On its face, that's true. But I might point out that in Europe, the countries in Europe, which we love to imitate whenever we're trying to enact benefit law, almost every one of them has a paid leave policy which involves an employer and employee match. Yes, there are government subsidies in places, but almost invariably it is, it, it is a contribution that is provided by both the employer and the employee and it is negotiated 
between each. The problem with HR1 is it not that it will be a benefit decreed, it will wind up being a benefit denied. Smaller employers will have to cut back on the benefits they have to pay for the new benefit that they have to provide. And more perniciously, they will probably not ever get to the paid leave threshold because they will take the least cost option, which is now the government mandate. Having said all of that, I would argue strongly that you waive your normal rules of procedure and allow us to present this amendment tomorrow. Not because I think it will pass. I know it won't. I know the skids are greased on this. But this debate must continue on beyond tomorrow. With that in mind, I have already approached the White House about this. They are uh, receptive, at least, to the idea. Um, but I, I would merely say it would be a tragedy that if, if we merely shortstop this argument as, as something that is unfinished from the last Congress and we must complete, because it will not complete uh, or in any way ameliorate the conditions of people out there earning a paycheck and living from that paycheck to the next one if we don't provide an incentive for workers and their employers to invest in human capital. I heard Mr. Solomon say that he didn't think this amendment would be made in order. I'm, I'm sure that he did not mean to imply that this was a done deal. I mean, that would, I would be shocked at that, Mr. Solomon. That would mean that the Rules Committee would basically be a sham, and of course none of us believe that. But, but let, a, let, me, let me just say that I realize there are, there are severe procedural inhibitions about waiving a rule to allow a tax amendment to go through. I have written the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee, as most members know, and said, I realize this is uh, abbreviating the procedure, but I hope you understand that we have to move this debate forward. I appreciate the opportunity to come to the Rules Committee. I appreciate that the camera is back. But I also would appreciate having a full discussion of this tomorrow. And it's not like we have so much we have to do. I mean, if it's between this and ending the select committees, I would prefer talking about this. But on that note, Mr. Chairman, I would just urge very strongly that you do allow this debate to go forward. Because I think that if we continue the debate on leave policy as a benefit that can actually be used and is employer and employee friendly, we will do more to realize what the President said in putting people first than we will if we just uh, strangle the process and, and jam HR1 through. And I thank the Chair. Um, Mr. Grandy, as, some, as a member, and I'm speaking about myself now, who has sometimes differed with the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on matters of jurisdiction, uh, you realize that, uh, that he jealously guards the jurisdiction of his committee. I not only know that, uh, I took uh, the precaution of writing him this letter to say I'm not trying to, to in any way uh, abbreviate your jurisdiction. I'm just saying time is of the essence. Uh, Did he I, respond to your letter? He has not responded yet, but I, I want to make one other point here, Mr. Chairman. It's taken me a year to develop this model. The reason I didn't have this out for the White House last fall when they came up with their, in my view, rather lame tax credit to provide leave in the workplace is because this involves refiguring s simplified employer pension plans and Section 125 uh, uh, cafeteria plans, and this is complicated law. It took a long time. The only reason I'm trying to do this now is because I have to pay beat the clock, and that's essentially what I said to the chairman. So I would, best of all possible worlds would be if we did not vote tomorrow, this bill went to the Ways and Means Committee, and at a later date we came back and talked about a family-friendly friendly use policy. But nobody wants to get in the chairman's face less than I do, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the other side, and, and uh, I don't look to create enemies like that. But I did think that it, this is an important enough issue to bring it to the committee now and try and suspend the process. Mr. Solomon? Well, Fred, I'm not going to repeat what I told uh, Bill Orton and Jennifer Dunn in support of your amendment. But, um, you know, gridlock still exists. And, and this, uh, you, you pointed out with your, uh, your excellent testimony, uh, legislation this so important should really go to the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee should debate the issue. Then we should go to the floor with both concepts, and both concepts should be debated, and 100% of the membership ought to have a voice instead of just 10%, those 10% that serve on the Education and Labor Committee. Um, you, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, you were afraid that the uh, skids were greased uh, on the bill, and as you know, and I know they are, uh, and I'm ashamed to say that they are that this rule is skid uh, is greased as well. 
uh, because uh, I'm, I know that your amendment will not be made in order, and uh, that's a shame. And I will tell you what I told Bill Orton and Jennifer Dunn. Please come to the floor. There is going to be at least three hours and 20 minutes of debate. The entire House and, and the American people need to hear what you just told this committee, because if they did, uh, we might gain a lot of support for your your concept on, on this idea. And so I it's a simple matter of defeating the previous question for now, isn't it? It is. The uh, <laughs> gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Quillen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Red, you're a very persuasive person. I think in presenting your argument to the floor, it would have a very favorable response. Hopefully, this committee will listen also. I historically have been opposed to the Family Leave Act, and still am, because of the federal mandate. But what you propose would uh, uh, sweeten the uh, bill to the extent that some people might vote for it who are opposed to it. Well, that would be my hope. I mean, I'm trying to sweeten the deal without having people sour on the mandate, and that's that's one of the reasons I've worked on this for so long. Yeah. Well, I, uh, remaining on the floor to work with the president uh, intrigues me. Did you have any luck? Well, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, we are at this point dealing with congressional liaison people because they don't have all of their second-level staff. But I will say this, Mr. Quillen, uh, we got a very warm reception from the congressional liaison person, and, and she concurred that this kind of um, compromise between offering opportunity for all and demanding responsibility from all is part and parcel of what the president has talked about on health care reform, welfare reform, and shared sacrifice on whatever economic package he offers. So I, uh, I hope that this will be the first of many discussions and, uh, you know, we're, we're in exile now. Our party doesn't really control much of anything. But if, if there is still any merit in debating the quality of ideas, I think we're going to prevail. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If I could counter what Mr. Solomon said, let me uh, simply for the record say that where there is life, there is hope. <laughs> And uh, I am going to leave here now and go to a meeting of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. And uh, I uh, am one who believes that, well, it will be difficult to uh, enact anything that will make your amendment in order at this time. Uh, I am optimistic that we're going to be able to do what the American people want us to do, and that is reform this institution so that there is a modicum of fairness which will enhance the opportunity for amendments like this to be made in order. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. And thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, uh, you for allowing me this opportunity to uh, testify, and I'll make it brief. I know you've had a long morning uh, on uh, the uh, rule affecting family medical leave. Um, I was not an original uh, supporter of Pat Schroeder's legislation when it was first introduced uh, three years ago. Uh, some of the concerns that I had, which many of my Republican colleagues and some Democratic colleagues shared, relating to the definition of the family medic uh, member, the uh, medical uh, procedure to be used in certifying the necessity for the leave, the length of time for the leave, and uh, other uh, concerns that we raised uh, were in fact addressed in a bipartisan compromise that uh, our colleague, Bart Gordon, and a member of this committee, and I jointly offered on the House floor. Uh, the Weldon-Gordon Compromise, which passed the House, is in fact the bill that we will have on the House floor tomorrow. It has been uh, greatly strengthened. It has been tightened up in terms of the certification process required to uh, be able to uh, use a family leave policy. The time, in fact, has been shortened. The definition has been uh, tightened up. And, and I think it's basically a bill that, uh, whose time has come. Uh, listening to some of the comments and testimony here uh, uh, kind of sparked some memories of three years ago when I tried to convince uh, at that point in time President Bush and my uh, Republican colleagues in the conference that perhaps we should come up with an alternative to the family leave policy. Unfortunately in our conference that was not the desire and uh, it wasn't until late last year that we finally decided to work up a compromise based upon tax incentives which I also think uh, is valid and, and has, uh, has merit. 
be it as it may, that will not be the issue we vote on tomorrow. It will be, in fact, the family medical leave bill that we had in the 102nd Congress. I have an amendment that is very simple, very straightforward, uh, does not require any waiving of points of order, but it sends a clear signal. Uh, one of the arguments used against family medical leave has been cost. I happen to think that's not a serious argument. The GAO estimates the cost per employee uh, for this policy would be about $5.30 per year. However, I do have concern that the federal government in imposing uh, legislation does not fully consider the effect upon state and local government. As I travel around my district, especially our, our school districts, I am constantly reminded of concerns that they are facing dealing with underground storage tanks, asbestos removal, other concerns that in fact uh, result from federal legislation. Therefore, what I am asking is for you to consider as a, uh, as a, um, a uh, in order tomorrow, an amendment that will allow a sense of the, of the House uh, that um, future legislation should be considered to reimburse state and local governments for any costs associated with this policy. I think that's minimal, but I think it's an important signal that we send that yes, we think this legislation is important, and I'm going to support it, but we also feel it's important that when the federal government thinks that these kinds of issues are so important that we agree to pick up the cost to state and local government uh, associated with that if in fact there is cost. So I would ask you to consider this amendment. I would also ask unanimous consent that by my formal uh, statement be made a part of the record and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have and appreciate your time this, this afternoon. Without objection, your entire statement will be entered in the record. I would ask uh, Mr. Solomon if he has any questions. <coughs> No, let me just uh, thank the gentleman for coming before us. Uh, your amendment is just a sense of Congress yes. resolution. Yes. Uh, certainly it doesn't require any uh, waivers. Uh, basically, uh, uh, all you're doing is saying it's a sense of Congress that uh, the, the cost uh, not be borne by state and local governments. Yes, and exactly. Makes, School districts. Uh, as a former uh, local official, along with you, uh, I certainly share your view. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. I agree with Mr. Solomon, and Kurt, I also agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Mr. Goss. I'll join the chorus and say I, too, agree with you. As a former local government official, both at municipal and county level, I realize uh, exactly what you're talking about. Do you have any idea what the, the number consequence is? Have you done any homework, or does you mean anybody in terms of public uh, dollars? Uh, uh, no. Well, the cost uh, by the GAO estimated uh, cost of this benefit per employee per year is supposedly $5.30. Now, that's subject to a lot of debate both as a high figure and a low figure. But we don't know what the cost would be to local government. And what we're saying is if there is a cost, this Congress should implement legislation to reimburse the state and local governments for that cost. Understood. I just tried to get it some kind of handle on no, the magnitude. I don't, have, I don't have the figure. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. The, uh, the only remaining witness uh, on this piece of legislation uh, is the Honorable John Micah from Florida. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, rather than read a lengthy uh, prepared statement, uh, I come today before you as a new member of Congress, but also somebody who's been involved in small business and also consulting uh, and working with large businesses in the country. Uh, I probably made the mistake of reading this uh, bill, H.R. 1, and uh, let me tell you that uh, I'm really frightened by what I've read here. Um, I think if we ever write the history of how we destroyed business and the economy in this nation, that this will be one of the uh, exhibits uh, uh, to show how the, uh, the country went down the uh, economic tubes. Um, I read this, and with dismay, I read that uh, we, we put all the enforcement provisions, we, we give the Department of Labor the ability to promulgate uh, additional rules, we uh, impose uh, mandates on uh, local uh, governments on school boards. You've heard all the questions that have been raised just since I came into the room about what does this do, what's the cost. And then uh, Title III, which is the heart of my uh, uh, proposed amendment, which I would like the opportunity to present to the uh, full house, deals with the, a commission on leave. My God, after we've done all this uh, and we've created uh, this monstrosity, then we're going to look at what we've done. And the, the Congress as an institution uh, is probably in its lowest level of esteem that uh, we, could, we could ever have. And here again, uh, with this piece of legislation, I think we're taking the cart before the horse. 
we're imposing mandates on local government, we're going to be driving people and, uh, who are in business out of business, encouraging people to go overseas and relocate. We're going to set a whole new level of government regulation we don't know the cost of. And then to top it all off, uh, my esteemed colleagues, we exempt ourselves from the uh, penalty provisions of this. So I come here as a new member. I'm dismayed by the process uh, that we, uh, we probably won't even get an opportunity to discuss these issues on the floor. And when we, when we have Sears uh, uh, eliminating within the last week uh, the announcement of th tens of thousands of jobs, I'm going out to Boeing with one of the subcommittees. They're announcing layoffs of jobs. And then you look at this, just the little information I've gotten, 83% of the companies over 50, uh, with 50 employers in this uh, country already comply with this. 39 states have some provisions, and I've just learned some local governments have provisions. So what are we doing? The 17% that aren't complying, we're imposing this. We're, this, well, this is the type of thing is, that is the straw that breaks the back uh, on business. We don't know the full effects of it. And the worst part about this, uh, again, uh, members of this committee, is that it is a sham on the people who really need uh, uh, family and medical leave. Many of the people out there in America think that you are going to pass this week something that will affect them. And from the statistics of this Congress, over 50% of those employees uh, do not uh, uh, have any um, hope or attention under the, this bill. Those are the ones that need the attention. So rather than create incentives, rather than to really be knowledgeable before we move forward on this legislation, we're going to pass it pell-mell. We're going to ram it down the throats of the American business community without knowing the full impact. So that's why I come here today as a new member <laughs> saying, uh, let us be heard. Uh, I'm bringing the, the, uh, the uh, maybe not the, the judgment of, of uh, 562,000 people from Florida, but uh, they, I am bringing uh, at least uh, my uh, estimation of this legislation and deserve to be heard. Thank you. Gentlemen from New York, Mr. Sala. <coughs> John, let me welcome you to the uh, Rules Committee for the first time. Uh, you know, I came here 15 years ago with your brother, Dan, and uh, even though he was a Democrat on the other side of the aisle, he uh, was a good friend of mine. Uh, and let me commend you also for your excellent participation this morning on a talk show. Uh, uh, you did very, very well. You said when you started off that you have read this bill and that you're frightened. Well, let me tell you what you haven't done. You have not had the opportunity to read the majority report which is five times thicker than this bill. You haven't had a chance to read the minority views to that majority report, which is also uh, voluminous. Uh, often, legislative intent is, comes from the, the majority report or the, uh, that accompanies these bills. We don't even have it. It hasn't even been filed. Will be filed probably for another couple of hours. Yet, members of this Congress have had to have their amendments before this committee as of noontime yesterday without really knowing what is in this bill. And that's just a doggone shame. It's a question, again, of 10% of this body, uh, the members of the Education and Labor Committee, dictating to the rest of us, the other 90%. Now, your amendment uh, has been brought out by Mr. Dreyer, and I think um, uh, Mr. Goss and Mr. Quill and myself. Uh, there have been no studies at all. And what's your... Uh, amendment would do would be to, as I understand it, it would uh, study the existing and proposed leave policies, the potential cost, benefits, and impact on the productivity of employees. Now, there are no studies out there, so we're voting blind. Your amendment is excellent. Uh, you ought to have your day in court. It's a completely germane amendment uh, to the bill, and yet probably we're not going to have that opportunity. We're going to fight awfully hard to make your amendment in order because uh, but whether we do or not, you ought to come to the floor during the th only three hours that are there, and you're a freshman member, so you have to fight for the one minute or two minutes you might be allocated to get your point across. But you please come to that floor and get your point across that you've made here today. They're excellent points. And I thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Uh, 
Mr. Solomon, uh, you may, <clears throat> you've uh, repeatedly referred to 10%. Of course, uh, you don't mean to suggest that there won't be a vote on the rule require, which requires a majority vote on the floor. No, there will be one, and uh, we all know that the uh, Democrat caucus has laid down the, the law to Democrat members uh, on procedural votes. You better vote with the party or else. Uh, that's not a fair vote, but we're going to make that fight. Well, there, the there, there, is, there, is a majority, there is a requirement for a majority vote, both on the previous question and on the rule itself on the floor. And from time to time, some Democrats do vote with Republicans on those matters. Well, there are a few good Democrats over there. I used to be one. Well, I just didn't want to leave the impression that there would not be a majority, a requirement for a majority vote uh, before this rule could be adopted by the House of Representatives. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been sitting here all during the debate on this rule, this measure before us. But your testimony is the best, and I can see why you're winding up the uh, debate today. You put things in crystal clear language. Having read the measure, analyzed it, I think it, it is a boondoggle that's going to lead into a lot of bureaucratic red tape and supervision and uh, uh, dangers along the line. Anything that, uh, that is passed in this regard without any regulations being written, without those regulations being published in the Federal Register, it's going to be a nightmare and, and will not help people who uh, are working that need to raise a family or are in illness. Or, uh, I couldn't agree with you. More. Thank, Thank you, you for being here, and I, we're just so glad to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very proud of my colleague from Florida. I think he's been extremely persuasive, as uh, my colleague from Tennessee has just said. And we've got uh, a situation here where I think uh, the speaker said it very well. He said there isn't particularly meant to be a whole lot of fairness on the Rules Committee because the Rules Committee really is the agent of the Speaker's office. And as you look how things uh, proceed, you can understand that. And it's a very fair, and I think he made a bold statement, and I think he was accurate. But I think you've been able to come forward and articulate a case which is extremely important, be made and be made and be made and be made. Because it's the other side of the, the question, and it's legitimate. Uh, we all have a good intention here for families and for medical situations. And we're all trying to find an affordable and reasonable way. And I think your way, frankly, is a better way than H.R. 1. Uh, what I am afraid I can't tell you is that we are going to adopt your way. But I appreciate you coming forward. And don't feel bad about one minute of time on the floor. Uh, some of us have been here a little longer than two years and still have a hard time getting one minute on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Michael. Thank you. And uh, I just want to make sure, there are there any other uh, uh, members who wish to testify on this bill? If not, that concludes the testimony on the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. The House Rules Committee went on to consider H.R. 2, the National Voter Registration Bill. Now that the Rules Committee has passed the Family Leave Bill and sent it on to the House floor, members are scheduled to take up the legislation during Wednesday session. Join us for live coverage at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. Coming next, the remarks of President Clinton to the National Governors Association. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America.